Good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, it, I would like to welcome you to this, um, this very exciting session uh, titled African Perspectives on AMR Surveillance and Wastewater Management. Um, this is a, a, a topic that I think is, um, is, is getting great attraction in the world at the moment. Uh, it's been used routinely as a mechanism for tracking uh, drug surveillance, etc. But really, I think in the last um, few years, its application to COVID surveillance has really, it, when I experienced, jumped to the next level. So I'm, I'm Richard Gordon. Um, I'm kind of wearing several hats in this session today. Um, the first hat is uh, I'm a member of the JPIMR um, Steering Committee a Management Board, and I have been for the last four or five years. And uh, it's been my great honor and privilege to serve and represent South Africa on this, on this, on this board. And we've been wanting to get a, a conference program up and running with Africa for this year. And obviously, with the travel bans that have been going on and the, the restrictions on travel, it was very difficult to do this in person. So <clears throat> that's the first thing to say. The second hat I'm wearing is a, a South African Medical Research um, hat, uh, Medical Research Council hat, where we've been funding a, a surveillance program um, here in South Africa, which really was born out of COVID um, uh, April next year, but it has quickly turned into one of the leading uh, programs, um, in what we think in, in, in surveillance and linking that with genomic surveillance. So, so just very briefly, JPIMR, for those of you who haven't have heard of it, is, is a, initially an EU member-led uh, uh, program, um, which really focuses on One Health, uh, One Health antimicrobial research. Uh, and that's really what stands it apart from many of the other different platforms that exist, where it either typically tend to focus on human health, veterinary health, um, or environmental health. It is really try and encompass all of them. So, um, so, so there's approximately 30 member states now, um, no longer really an EU-led initiative in the sense that there are a number of countries outside of the EU that are members. And, and JPIMR is a major funder of, of research uh, in antimicrobial research um, for One Health. So the, the real goal of this program is to really um, encourage interaction, um, knowledge sharing um, for our European counterparts to learn what's kind of going on in Africa, for our African counterparts to find out what's kind of going on in Europe in the space, to compare notes, um, to see if there are synergies that can be explored, and ultimately to be able to do um, uh, intercontinental research projects. So I'm going to stop there. Um, we have, well, just to say that uh, we have got over 200 people who are registered for this meeting um, from well over, I think, 25 countries at this stage. So it's been a very exciting program. And I just want to congratulate the JPIMR team, Patrick and his team, and Surani from the South African Medical Research Council, and to thank the speakers for, at very short notice, putting a program together um, of this nature and having what looks like is going to be well over 100 people um, attend the session. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the, the first um, um, chair uh, or moderator of the afternoon session, who I believe is the, the very strong Swedish sounding name of Rulof Kutzer, uh, who is based at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Um, so Prof Kutzer, over to you. Okay, hello, thank you so much for attending today's uh, workshop. Um, I will be the chair of this session. Here are our panelists today. And my name is Rolf Kurze. I am from the Department of Infectious Diseases from the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. This is the program we will be following today, and I would like to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Carlos Poseidon. He's the director of the Unit of Environmental Sciences and Management from the Northwest University in South Africa. Carlos Poseidon is employed at the Northwest University as a professor in microbiology and is currently the research director in the Unit for Environmental Sciences and Management. His post PhD career is focused on various aspects of aquatic microbiology, including surface and groundwater quality, as well as aspects of water treatment. He has also over 22 years of experience has supervised a large number of postgraduate students that are active in the water sector and has published numerous peer-reviewed publications in this field. Carlos is also a member of the Groundwater Division and a fellow of ESA. Thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Pizetko. Thank you, Rulo, for that kind introduction. Can I start sharing my screen? 
Ro, thank you for that introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Um, I've decided to change the title of the original. Sorry, let me start my video. Yeah. Can you see my video? Right. I've, I've decided to change it slightly just to focus in, in general on AMR in water and then potential risks for Africa. Um, So water is that global linker that basically touches everything uh, that we touch and uh, uh, we use it and then um, it gets back into uh, the natural system. Um, so the question is then why should we, we be concerned about antimicrobial resistant drivers in the aquatic environment? Um, as humans, once we've used that water, it goes back into the environment as I've indicated but then it is used by um, the, the plants, uh, gets back into uh, the system to be used by livestock, which is basically our food, um, and it will get back to us through our drinking water. So, um, and uh, as Richard has indicated, we should constantly be in mind that this one health approach to ensure healthy humans, uh, healthy animals and the healthy environment is then critical. And then that should be the principle in which um, we manage this. But unfortunately, the situation is not as, um, as clear. And um, that uh, mortality rate, once we start talking about death rates, um, people tend to sit up and, and, and listen. Um, and if one com uh, consider uh, the WASH services, um, this is 20, 2012 uh, details that indicate uh, in Africa, the mortality rate is quite high, uh, and that is due to consumption of uh, unsafe water. And that could be linked to uh, sanitation, um, unimproved sanitation for a large part of Africa. Um, we have parts of Africa that is absolutely uh, well in terms of uh, improved sanitation, but they are uh, a large part of Africa that is uh, not as well provided for. The uh, global snapshot of water quality um, have a number of, of points, but uh, I'm highlighting a few of them. Um, and the obvious one is that good water quality and quantity is essential for achieving uh, the sustainable development goals for health, food security, and water security. But since the 1990s, and it could be before then as well, the water quality uh, in Africa and in other low and middle income countries uh, has worsened and that was due to water pollution. So the pollution could be organic, inorganic as well. And uh, those are contaminants of concern or contaminants of emerging concern. That is a major problem. Uh, and this is basically due to wastewater loading. The other load uh, is pathogen loads um, that can, through uh, treatment processes, be prevented that it gets into uh, water that is used for direct consumption. But that may, might not always be the case. Also, uh, that water uh, that is used for recreation, uh, recreation and bathing and, re and religious purposes um, is definitely not treated. Uh, and particularly the rural poor are the ones that are affected by that. So in terms of wastewater treatment, uh, treatment plants, particularly in urban settings, in some cases also rural settings, um, have sources of, of, of the, the sewage coming from uh, various uh, parts of um, those communities, households, uh, it could be a runoff, a clinical and hospital, etc. And uh, would then go into a physical and biological treatment process. And then uh, through disinfection, uh, the treated water then leaves the wastewater treatment plant. But um, in all of those, there are bacteria and one can add viruses and yeast to it, as well as these chemicals. 
Um, and those uh, bacteria, chemicals, uh, as well as the solids that come out of that system uh, could be used for various purposes, but it can also be dumped, um, which means that if there are chemicals that can uh, select for and maintain AMR, uh, those will be part of what goes into the environment. Now, if one considers that the, and these are just uh, bacteria and some yeast, the uh, WHO list of priority pathogens, uh, these ones could be potentially part of um, the bacterial consortium that leaves a wastewater treatment plant if that water is not, or that effluent is not treated properly could also be present in some of the, the solids that leaves and gets out into the environment. Now, our audit of wastewater treatment plants in South Africa, um, and I couldn't find any similar audit elsewhere, um, and that it, it might be available, but this has shown that uh, the number of plants that were audited, the majority of them were either poorly functioning or they were non-functioning uh, at all with uh, only uh, about 20% of them uh, that uh, was actually working well. Now detection and fate of um, the antibiotic resistant bacteria and wastewater treatment plants have been coming on for a long time and there's been quite a lot of work that has been done. Um, but there are still some uh, uh, fundamental data that is lacking. Um, and one of it, uh, a recent article also referred to when they looked at the gaps, is uh, ARB and ARG, antibiotic resistant bacteria and antibiotic resistant genes, their abundance in uh, wastewater treatment plants, as well as the, the impacts. And uh, whether the antibiotics that are detected in uh, the wastewater treatment system are the only ones that are responsible for the horizontal gene transfer or the transfer uptake of uh, ARGs that uh, may land up in, in, um, in the aquatic system uh, within that wastewater treatment plant. And then also the impacts of the effluent uh, that might have on uh, natural systems. Um, two studies that uh, looked at specifically uh, ARGs um, in wastewater systems using metagenomics approaches. So besides the, uh, the culture base, there's also metagenomic approaches that are available for us to study these uh, and to investigate. Uh, this particular study from uh, BOMA and uh, OCO uh, had a sp specific uh, view of uh, looking at the, pre the prevalence and fate um, of uh, carbapenem resistant genes in hospital effluents and in wastewater treatment plants. And they provided a critical review with uh, some important recommendations that, they were, ma that were made from uh, that study. Um, pharmaceuticals um, within wastewater treatment plants, that is really a cause for concern. Uh, and various studies have uh, shown that uh, uh, globally, as well as in South Africa and other parts of Africa, that these uh, do occur. This particular study focused on um, antimicrobial use and uh, resistance in food production systems in Africa. Now, the, the, the study span from uh, the, the uh, literature investigated was from 1980 to 2021. And after processing everything, there were only six, one, 160 articles that could be included. But what they found is that about 60 tons um, of um, antimicrobials are used in plant and about a similar amount in livestock production. The study also found that the reporting rates for uh, use as well as AMR resistance in Africa is very low, although uh, there is a positive sign and that it's increasing. Uh, between 27 and 30 countries uh, over uh, the last three years have reported uh, the AMUs to the WHO and the OIE. 
Um, a comparison of um, pharmaceuticals and freshwater uh, aquatic systems between Africa and the European Union has shown that um, maximum concentrations in Africa, in some cases, were nearly 20 times, 20,000 times higher than in Europe. And that uh, measured concentrations in Africa uh, up to almost 8,000 8, times higher than ecotoxic, uh, ecotoxic uh, toxicity uh, endpoints. Now, these things are then in wastewater and uh, landing up in our water systems or either through poorly treated or untreated sewage that lands up in it. It means that uh, our uh, agriculture, our food production and, and irrigation um, will definitely be negatively affected because of that contaminated water. But the contaminated water will also result in um, the particularly rural communities within um, Africa that makes use of these water sources for various uh, purposes. So there are lessons that we could take um, from this. This is sketching the, uh, a scenario um, that um, there are certain lessons uh, that is out there and that one can take forward uh, into addressing the issues within Africa. The one, and I get back to the crude death rate, um, the crude death rate in the US between nine, 1900 and 2000 were dramatically decreased because of certain interventions. Chlorine, uh, the use of chlorine um, uh, within municipal drinking water systems, as well as the age of uh, antibiotics, as well as vaccines, has done a huge amount to ensure that, uh, that death rate decreased. One considers from the World Bank, um, the current that the EU crude death rate uh, sort of hovers between 10.6 uh, and uh, 9.6 per thousand. Uh, for Africa, uh, if one looks at it, then um, it sort of paints a picture that um, well, we are currently at 8.2 uh, number of deaths per thousand people. Um, is that now, are we fine? And, but uh, with AMR being a looming uh, disaster uh, and the increase in the number of deaths uh, that are occurring, are currently occurring and will occur, that currently there are about 700,000 people globally that's dying of uh, AMR-related causes, and that could increase to 10 million in 2050. And the brunt of that is going to be felt by Africa and Asia. That is what the predictions are saying, and that is what we need to, uh, processes that we need to put in place to avert. Also, the cost, whether it is uh, at the low um, AMR rate or whether it's a high AMR rate, it's going to become unaffordable for Africans. So interventions are needed. Um, a 2017 study on AMR in Africa, this, uh, this review, has indicated at that time uh, about um, 40% uh, percent of countries in Africa did not have any AMR data available or did not make it available uh, generally. It could be there, but it's not made available for general use. Um, and uh, that resistance to common, commonly prescribed antibodies were quite high. But one concern that they, that they had was the quality of the data that they could let, uh, let their hands on. Uh, in another study, uh, and this was on the role of civil uh, society organizations, specifically focusing on national action plans on AMR. Uh, in green, we have countries where the AMR, uh, national AMR uh, action plans are in place, and where the dots is where uh, civil organizations is actually uh, actively involved. But there are countries in Africa where uh, the process is basically started. In some cases, there is no data available for those countries. 
uh, and that is uh, of concern. Now this recent um, review on the knowledge gaps and there's a number of them that uh, have been published over time. Excuse me. Um, have listed a number of issues and some of these issues, uh, risk assessment, for example, AI protection, uh, et cetera. Uh, a number of these have, are also featured in some of the others, other studies as well. And uh, we are aware of these knowledge gaps and there are certain solutions that are being proposed. And some of this is what um, the, our, we as scientists from Africa could uh, uh, look into and, and, and uh, specifically um, with counterparts from elsewhere start investigating. So that we have a set of knowledge that's available uh, from local uh, scenarios. There is the World Health Organization with the annual um, World uh, Antibiotic Awareness Week with a number of programs that are taking place. And just recently we had uh, these events taking place. Um, some of them were hosted locally uh, where we involved some uh, uh, scientists from elsewhere in Africa, uh, but also uh, it was mostly in our case, local uh, participation. But there's opportunity um, for expanding this. And these are uh, some of the calls that we've put out and that was 2020 as well as 2021. And the one, the last one here in blue on the 18th of November, that is, was a symposium where we had uh, a number of uh, speakers from elsewhere uh, in Africa involved. <clears throat> So some of the take home messages uh, that I think uh, might be important is that these uh, antimicrobial residues, the bacteria, the genes in sewage and in wastewater effluent is a grave concern. Poorly treated un, uh, and, uh, or untreated sewage um, is a major health threat uh, because of the pathogens, but also the chemicals. And uh, in both cases of the pathogens, uh, as well as the chemicals that spread of AMR, into the environment um, is then a real threat for us. So properly operated wastewater treatments will reduce uh, the levels of these. Um, it will not stop it, but it will at least re reduce it. Uh, so there's, a, a, I would think, um, a place where an intervention, an investment in efforts to enforcing decent sanitation options uh, could uh, assist in preventing that uh, issue that we may have with the numbers of deaths. Surveillance of AMR uh, in the environment in Africa, I think that is a, that's a critical um, aspect that is being left behind globally. Uh, it's only now coming to a real fore um, within um, the developed world. But I think in Africa, there's a lot of work that needs to go into um, AMR and the importance of AMR and AMR use reporting uh, to assist with the surveillance programs. The reporting needs to be strengthened, I think, but also well-organized funding opportunities and um, Richard has indicated about the JP, JPI AMR uh, opportunities that there might be, but also from governments and from the AU. Uh, African Union and World Bank, because we need some basic research, but also uh, research that will have strategic impacts locally, regionally, as well as globally, uh, and risk assessment in the African context is uh, an ap absolute uh, important aspect that one cannot leave behind. Uh, to address these uh, national action pl uh, plan needs, uh, so funding, to be made available insofar as that is concerned. And then a number of interventions that are needed and that will probably be also be listed elsewhere, the policies, stewardship programs, the implementation of uh, One Health uh, approach. I think all, also important is the reflection by researchers that work uh, in uh, antimicrobial use and AMR in Africa, that there should be annual workshops uh, perhaps during um, the World uh, Antibiotic Awareness Week or other uh, events 
but also joint publications to come out um, out of this so that we can really determine what knowledge do we have, what are the gaps, what do we need to do for impact, uh, and also to annually uh, evaluate our, our progress. Now, Mike, the question that I have is, is the pace at which we do our AMR work sufficient to avert the catastrophe that 4.2 million Africans will die from AMR related causes by 2050? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Lusagna, for that very interesting talk on giving us some perspective on the current um, standpoint on, on the issue. Um, our next speaker is Professor William Gaze from the European Center for Environment and Human Health, part of the University of Exeter Medical School in the United Kingdom. Um, he's a professor of microbiology at the Euro European Center for Environmental and Human Health, part of the University of Exeter Medical School. He leads a large research group focusing on the environmental dimension of antimicrobial resistance with recent and current funding of four million pounds with over 20 group members. They research the evolution of resistance in complex microbial communities found in human, animal, and environmental microbiomes. They also study the dis dissemination of AMR at a landscape scale and human exposure and transmission in aquatic environments. Thank you so much for being with us today, Professor. Uh, you may share your screen and start your presentation. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Great, thanks. Okay, right. I'll get started. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, I'm not going to give a, a big uh, introduction to myself because you've already done that. Um, but I work at the University of Exeter, but actually in the Cornwall campus, which is in the far southwest of England. And we have one site on the, on the hospital site because I work in the medical school, but also big microbiology labs in the Environment and Sustainability Institute. Right. Sorry. So when we think of AMR in the environment, often we, we look at um, diagrams like this, which actually in, in Canada, I think, which this was where Dr. Irwin, who cr created this, um, was working. They call these confusograms. And there are much more confusing ones than this with so many boxes, so many um, connecting lines. Um, but really, of course, this summarizes the one health thinking around AMR, that uh, humans and animals and the environment are all important. But we think of this as a relatively new concept, but actually, if you look back, I was intrigued by the fact that in this one here, it said after Linton 1977. So I went back to the original uh, document. So this is 45 years old. And we can see that actually, really, this is encapsulating this One Health idea of AMR. And, you know, sewage, which we're really interested today in, is, of, of course, one of the main sort of routes into the environment of AMR from humans. Um, and then we get returned back into humans with bathing water, but also drinking water and through the food chain as well. So I thought it was remarkable really that, that, that this, this, this idea of course has been around a long time. The only change that I would have made was that these, these arrows indicate selective pressure, dark sort of high selective pressure and the white low selective pressure. Now we know that there is selective pressure in the environment from um, antibiotic residues as well in some cases. So as, as all of you know, antibiotic resistance is not a new phenomenon and it predates um, human use of antibiotics. But this is a diagram uh, figure from one of Jerry Wright's papers. And this is the beginning of the earth 4.6 billion years ago. So this is the geological timeline moving this way and then across here to current sort of origins of humans here. But we can see that actually the evidence we have to date suggests that antibiotic resistance genes evolved more than two billion years ago. Um, so before the first sort of what we might think of complex life, eukaryotic organisms that include plants, fungi and animals. So when I think about AMR and the environment or the environmental dimension of AMR, which I think actually is a better way to term it because it 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 suggests that the environment is actually part of the whole problem. Not, it's not just something separate that we just think about AMR in the environment. 
So there are these two, two phenomena. There's the, um, the long-term evolutionary emergence of resistance um, from the environmental resistome into human pathogens, which is sort of analogous to emergence of zoonotic infectious agents like SARS-CoV-2. So this is the figure, another of Jerry Wright's figures, which, which shows that in 30,000-year-old permafrost, you find resistant bacteria. If, you, if they are resistant to clinical antibiotics, you clone out those genes that confer resistance into modern bacteria, they confer resistance. So this is this long-term evolutionary process. The other, of course, which I think most people think about, they think about acute AMR transmission risk. So what is your actual individual risk of being exposed to and um, contracting an, an AMR infection from an environmental exposure. So these are obviously interlinked, but they're, they're two different processes, I think, and we need to think about them in slightly different ways. So I'm just going to develop this analogy between AMR and um, COVID-19 a little further. We know that zoonotic infections, it's wildlife reservoirs of viruses that spill over into humans, most of the time that doesn't achieve pandemic spread, but in some cases it does. If we think about AMR, we have these mobile resistance genes on plasmids, which actually many people think are related to viruses. Um, these are actually infecting or they are residing within as selfish entities. Um, sometimes they kill bacteria. They're not part of the bacteria um, within complex microbial communities. Sometimes those genes, those mobile elements move into human the human associated bacteria, the human microbiome, and occasionally those genes then achieve pandemic spread within the human microbiome and causing infections globally. So we can see these waves of genes like NDM and MCR that have, have, have been disseminated globally. So actually it, it is almost the same process. We talk about AMR as a pandemic. It, it is a pandemic, but it's, it's multiple pandemics of multiple, multiple agents. And one of the remarkable things I think that's, that's emerging in recent years, and this is a paper by Kalinian et al, looking at um, resistance in E. coli to uh, 3GCs and um, fluoroquinolones, but looking at antibiotic daily, daily dose consumption globally and looking at resistance. And there's no correlation between antimicrobial usage or antibiotic usage and resistance. And this is, may not be true for all organisms, AMR organisms, but you know, the, this, this, this idea that really it's only about AMU in humans, um, so it's just about stewardship and that will solve everything, um, of course, is far from the truth as, as, as many of us realise, but I think it's worth reiterating that. And in this paper, they concluded that a high prevalence of, of AMR can be more likely attributed to the, the dissemination of antimicrobial resistance, especially via poor sanitation and contaminated potable water. Um, and I think that this, obviously, as we just heard in the last talk, some of the, some of the um, pollution issues are accentuated in low and middle income countries. But even in countries like the UK, we have large amounts of raw sewage discharged into the environment. And we also have treated wastewater that still contains antibiotic residues and, and, and large, very large numbers of resistant organisms. So it, I think it's important globally, but it's more important in some places than others. And if we think about sewage specifically, this is a very nice diagram from Tong Zhang's group in Hong Kong, where these are round on the left-hand side, these are different sewage samples, and then these are the genes, so tetracycline, sulfonamide, whatever, all around on the right-hand side, and then just showing which genes are in which sewage samples. So basically it just shows that sewage is full of resistant, resistance genes, which, which we sort of, of course, know, but this is a, a good way to demonstrate that. And, you know, we can't really not talk about the, the Danish global uh, sewage surveillance project, which is, you know, sampled from, I think, now well over 100 um, countries. But this, this initial paper was based on um, 60 countries. And they found that, again, there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, correlation between antimicrobial usage, antibiotic usage and AMR. They also found that there were differences in diversity between Europe, North America, and Oceania, and Africa, Asia, and South America. Um, and they also found that there were strong correlations with socioeconomic health and environmental factors. So, you know, and this, of course, this predates the use of wastewater-based epidemiology for SARS-CoV-2. Um, a lot of people think it's something that's, that's been established during the pandemic, of course, but, but actually it's been used widely, not, not in the at the scale that we're seeing it at the, at the moment for, for 
for SARS-CoV-2, but, but, but this is just an illustration of how it's been used for AMR in the past. So our own work, um, maybe I've been working in this area for nearly 20 years, um, and we started thinking about sewage, looking at sewage sludge that was applied to land um, and, and things like that. And then actually in the UK, it's been quite hard to access uh, sewage treatment plants because they're, they're, they're private utilities. Um, so we, we started looking upstream and downstream of wastewater treatment plants. And this paper here by Greg Amos um, showed that there were big differences in sort of uh, CTXM15 bearing um, Enterobacteriaceae downstream of a treatment plant in the UK compared to upstream. And then we moved to a more sort of a, a catchment based um, uh, strategy where we looked at multiple sites within the Thames, um, the Thames River Thames catchment. And this was working with this. I, I was working at University of Warwick and this was with also with UK Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. And we, we um, this is all part of Greg Amos's PhD. And we did a uh, he did a transect of the River Thames, taking multiple samples and just looking at uh, class one integrates as a marker of resistance. So these are different sites in the top right with four samples, um, sampling time points per site. What we see is, of course, is that this integron prevalence, which is a good marker of resistance in the metagenome, um, varies dramatically between different sites. And when we actually looked at each site, so in the bottom right, um, the, the blue triangle is the actual sample site, and then within um, a 10 or 20 kilometer radius upstream, we looked at the location, the size and the type of all the wastewater treatment plants. And then if we did some sort of correlative analysis on the, on the bottom left, well, basically we can actually predict the prevalence of these markers of resistance quite accurately. And the biggest determinant is the distance from size of and type of wastewater treatment plant. So this really tells us that even in a country with, with quite good water, wastewater treatment, we're having a really big impact on, on AMR um, in the environment. And then we moved on with the, the same team actually to a much bigger metagenome-based project, which we're still actually, it's a very complex data set and we're still writing that up. This is one, one figure from that. So this is basically looking at um, the association between a source tracking marker for human sewage and the relative abundance of, of resistance genes. So looking at you know, all the 4,000 AMR genes that are in most databases. So we can start to see these are the genes that are really strongly linked to human sewage um, impact. So maybe these are gonna be new good surveillance targets in the future. And again, yeah, this is work done by, um, with Liz Wellington and Andrew Singer at the um, UKCEH. So other work we do is looking at evolution resistance. So um, going back to the previous talk, uh, thinking about antibiotic residues in the environment, we, we, people measure, them, measure the antibiotics and they measure AMR and they often co-correlate because they're coming from the same source, but it doesn't actually indicate there's any causal relationship between those environmental residues and the AMR bacteria in the environment. So there's other groups that are working on this. So Joachim Larson's group done a lot and Dan Anderson's group has also done a lot on this. Um, and what we've done is basically use a experimental evolution to look at complex microbials of communi uh, microbial communities that we passage um, for a week daily uh, across a whole different range of antibiotic concentrations. And what we find is that we can, we can determine experimentally thresholds for selection for um, different markers, in this case, again, in Taiwan, but we've also done full metagenomics and this for ciprofloxacin, for example, we see significant increased prevalence at 15 micrograms per litre, um, which, which um, is, is on the high end of what we might find in um, sort of European um, waste uh, river uh, aquatic samples. But it's in that sort of order of magnitude. There are other estimates based on diff different approaches that, um, that put that lower or higher, but it really the take home message is that environmental concentrations of antibiotics are likely to select for resistance. And this is another paper uh, by, um, by a colleague of mine, uh, which has basically tried to risk assess based on these experimental thresholds. Um, and this is for a range of antibiotics. And basically it shows for several antibiotics, there's a risk of selection based on European um, environmental concentrations um, that, that selection may occur. 
And then moving on from the sort of the selection, so we've looked at landscape, landscape scale dissemination, then the sort of the evolution, now the sort of what are the exposure risks. And we've done a lot of work working with the um, UK Environment Agency um, who um, monitor bathing water quality, so coastal bathing water quality where people swim. So we use their samples to estimate population level exposure to um, 3GC resistant E. coli. This is work of my colleague Anne Leonard. Um, and she estimated there's about 6 million recreational sessions that occur every year where um, ingestion of 3GC resistant E. coli occur. So of course, that, we don't know what that means in terms of duck colonization and infection, but the next study that she did was, was looking at that in a bit more detail. Um, we've also, that was the previous um, project was based on culturable um, uh, E. coli grown on selective media, but also we've looked at whole populations of E. coli and done a sort of a targeted metagenomics approach. So you can actually then look at the sort of the gene relative abundance in a population of E. coli. So that's another sort of environmental surveillance approach, this targeted targeted approach and actually Anne is now using that on 10 catchments in the UK to look at all in catchment processes and the associations with this exposure risk in the um, in the sort of estuarine and coastal receiving waters. Um, she also did a study looking at human co gut colonization the relative risk so we looked at surfers who are more likely to ingest large amounts of water and they were three times more likely to um, be colonized. Again, we still don't know what the infection risk is, but this is just one approach of looking at this, this issue um, and how you can start to use environmental surveillance to inform some of these risk, risk assessment. And this is just a paper from Dorado Garcia, um, a Dutch group. And what it shows is this is for ESBL genes, but actually that sewage of course, and, and wastewater and all these receiving waters. So wastewater, surface water, they cluster with the human clinical isolates or the genes found in human clinical isolates rather than these are all the animal and poultry ones. So, you know, wastewater and sewage, it's important for human transmission. We can see things emerging in policy now. There's the, um, the United Nations have highlighted it. I co-authored this report in 2017. The Water Framework Directive in the EU um, now has antibiotics on the hazardous compound watch list. Uh, Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive also discusses AMR. Um, EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, I've, I've just written an opinion, I was also co-author on that, looking at um, AMR in food producing environments, including how human pollution can contaminate that, and the, and the UK government are also investing money in this area. So moving on to surveillance, for the last few slides, so how do we go about surveillance? Well, the WHO is suggesting this ESBL producing E. coli is a one health target, and I think that's a very good single target and we've used that for those bathing water samples but it's it's not going to give us the answer to everything we also need pathogen and mge arg focused surveillance you know and we also need to understand where where we should focus this surveillance you know should it be at the interface of the different you know human animal animal environmental environmental human whatever so we can understand these ecological barriers of transmission so we had some, we're fortunate enough to get funded by JPIMR for a, a surveillance network, which had uh, 23 partners from 15 countries, including two from Africa. Um, so Sabir uh, Essak from South Africa and Martin Antonio from the Gambia. Um, and we've had several meetings. It was impacted by COVID and we're a bit behind with publishing our white paper, but that's coming out very shortly. And some of the issues that came up, um, I'm just gonna discuss in the next few slides for the last couple of minutes. So we concluded that approaches used in clinical or veterinary surveillance um, for, for AMR are not necessarily always going to be suitable for environmental surveillance. In some cases, yes, but in others, no. So, what, so what, what can we use environmental surveillance for? Well, we can establish AMR prevalence and look at spatial and temporal variability, which is sort of what we need as baselines to understand change over time. And that can be strain-based, but also can be gene-based. So strains, if you're looking at priority pathogens, but also we need to understand what's going on within in the resistome or in the metagenome. You can look at this exposure transmission risk assessment, which is what I've just talked to you that we've, we've tried to do. You can focus on pathogens of concern, or you can actually do that um, you know, using metag metagenomes as well. Um, you know, the ESBL tricycle project um, can, will be used for this, you know, for this looking at the single marker, but also you can actually then sequence those 
isolates to give more sort of genotypic um, information. There's also this risk of emergence of AMR in clinical pathogens. So this is much more complicated. And some people think it's not possible to do this, but I believe that it is. And these two papers here, one by um, Tong Zhang et al, and there's another one by Martinez, begin to unravel how, what, how do you assess risk from a metagenome data set where you've got relative, ab relative abundance of, of up to thousands of genes. So Zhang et al have a slightly simpler um, sort of protocol than Martinez, which is basically if a gene is being enriched within the metagenome and it's mobile, then, then you can attribute um, a high risk to that of emergence into human pathogens. And, you know, we need to focus on this interactions of antimicrobials and bacterial populations, as I've also described. Um, so it's not really good enough just to look at the antibiotics and AMR. You have to have this, this, this data to support the relationship, the causal relationship between them. And it's also, you know, people talk about wastewater-based epidemi epidemiology being environmental surveillance. It's not really environmental surveillance, but it's really a great medium or substrate to look at um, you know, population, human population level um, AMR, but also then what, if we understand the downstream fate of that, what the ongoing risks will be. And actually, um, Larson's group, um, Huber's et al. 2019, they encapsulate some of this thinking very elegantly in a, in a paper um, which was published in 2019. So barriers to adoption, there are concerns that environmental surveillance will reduce funding prioritization of clinical or veterinary surveillance. There's a historical focus of environmental protection agency on chemical monitoring. Um, so we need to move more towards thinking about bacterial. There's very isolated nature of government laboratories in different One Health sectors. There's a lack of awareness of the complexity of the environmental resistome and how it relates to AMR in the clinic. Um, and also because if you look at um, pathogens in sewage, they are human variant so actually genomics can't attribute environmental um, source attribution so that's an important issue my final summary i know i'm going a little over time so amr wastewater-based epidemiology is only one component of amr surveillance environmental surveillance and it's not really environmental but actually it's very important to know what is going into the environment as well as what the, what um you know amr is in the human population so we should focus on um, extant priority pathogens but also critically, we should look at how um, genes are being enriched and how they're moving between bacteria through horizontal gene transfer and ultimately emerging in human pathogens. We, you know, we know investment in sanitation and sewage treatment infrastructure correlate with AMR prevalence at a global scale. So that if, if there's one thing we can do, that is something that needs to be a focus of investment. And just finally, AMR surveillance is much more complex than SARS-CoV-2 surveillance. And we should be careful not to underestimate the power of environmental surveillance to enable understanding and management of AMR in human populations, but also to understand environmental transmission risk and this risk of emergence of AMR from the environmental resistome. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for that very, very informative uh, talk. Um, <clears throat> and I think one key factor that's popping out here is what are the risks and how should we prioritize them? Now I'll be presenting our next speaker for today, uh, Professor Vincent Chigo from the Department of Microbiology, Faculty of Biological Sciences, University of Nigeria, Lusaka in Nigeria. His PhD research assessed the quality, water quality, incidence of enteric viruses and microbial risks in the Buffalo River in the Eastern Cape Province of South Africa. Prof. Shiger's research into microbial freshwater pollution and the associated risks is continuing. He has demonstrated the survival and persistence of multi-drug resistant Escherichia coli O157 in surface waters used for freshwater produce irrigation. Comparative molecular analysis of environmental viral bacterial pathogens versus clinical strains will shed light in molecular epidemiology and the dispersion of virulence antibiotic resistance genes. Professor Shiger's research also focuses on natural products with antimicrobial activity, especially from plants, as a solution to the enduring problem of microbial resistance to antibiotics and the growing emergence of multi-drug resistant strains of pathogens. Thank you so much for being with us today, Professor. You may uh, share your screen and you may start your presentation.
Thank you. Thank you for that um, introduction. You have seen my screen now? We can see your screen. We can hear you. You may continue. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I really happy to be a part of this um, wonderful meeting. And um, we really appreciate all the efforts that have been put in to put this meeting together. I will be discussing antimicrobial resistance, um, a challenge we are having in Nigeria, but with emphasis on, on Vibrio cholera. Um, a little bit about myself, I had got my PhD from Fortier in 2013 and had been working with the University of Nigeria since 2006. Um, today I lead the Water and Public Health Research Group here and um, it's an interdisciplinary group so we have um, a wide range of uh, research interests, quite multidisciplinary. Um, I also want to say that over time, we've had some funders and collaborators in our research. And um, we've also been productive. We've been productive and um, that's about it. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Antimicrobial resistance in vibrio cholera. And um, sorry, I need to change this pattern a little. Okay, that's, that's okay. Um, antimicrobial resistance of vivio cholera, assessing the role of aquatic environment in an increasing challenge in Nigeria. Um, water is important and two most important questions for me to ask about water are, are they available? And if you have water, what's the quality? What's the quality of the water? Actually, the total volume of water on Earth is about 1.4 billion cubic kilometers. Um, but then out of all of this, only 3% um, is fresh water, and that's the water that is accessible to us. Um, again, a large percentage of that is locked up as um, ice caps and glaciers. And we have the groundwater which we need a lot to, to assess, and then surface water is just 0.6%. So water is scarce. But not only is the water is scarce, um, the water that is available to us comprises of, like I said, groundwater and surface water. And by definition, anyway, fresh water is water that contains less than 1,000 milligrams per liter of dissolved solids, most of the salt. And now when we are speaking of, of surface water, we are referring to the lakes and reservoirs and ponds and streams and creeks that we know, and even human-made streams. And, and of course, the freshwater um, wetlands. Now, not only is freshwater scarce, pure groundwater is costly to assess. And the cheap to dig shallow wells are mostly available here. Um, and surface waters are highly vulnerable to contamination. Besides that, the use of water in our households actually is what necessitates the need for wastewater treatment plants. And um, if we must manage water quality and reuse water, we can't, wastewater treatment plant becomes critical. Um, an antimicrobial resistance would occur in microorganisms such as bacteria and fungi, and other parasites become resistant to antimicrobial agents to a variety of mechanisms such as mutation or genetic exchange. Now, resistance can occur in the human and animal host or in environmental settings where the release of excreta and the presence of antimicrobial agents and other pollutants uh, deplete microbial populations and then could favor the persistence of resistant traits. Pollution favors um, the selection of resistance in human and, um, and, and as well as animal and environmental microbiomes. And the spread it's, is a huge global problem. Now, the role of water bodies in AML, water body can play a role in environmental dispersal, dispersal and transmission of AML in three ways. One, dispersal 
resistant pathogens via water resulting in the transmission of disease causing pathogens to humans and animals and plants, and thereby increasing, this would increase the need for treatment and with antimicrobial agents. And the sec secondly, silent transmission of resistant microorganisms with low pathogenicity will allow, you know, will become evident when they infect particularly vulnerable populations uh, or their genes are transferred to pathogens causing infection. And finally, the release of fecal and other pollutants, including antimicrobial compounds into the environment may promote resistance by creating conditions that favor um, transfer or emergence of new resistant genes. So in the freshwater setting, um, like already mentioned, they are susceptible to fecal contamination. What will result is that because when the contamination happens, uh, microorganisms are introduced as well as organic matter. And all of these and the presence of, of this will encourage the sharing of um, pathogenic uh, resistant determinants. In the contaminated aquatic environment, genetic materials can be shared between bacteria under selective pressure from antimicrobial microbial, thus causing shredding AMR determinants across environmental bacteria and, and the pathogens that have come from humans and animals. And then with respect to the wastewater treatment plants also, we just um, find out that they, they are a very, very contaminated aquatic environment. And what happens is that um, bacteria under selective pressure from antimicrobials, you know, can share um, not even just antimicrobials, the other agents like herbicides a lot that flows through sewage. Um, then that makes them very important receptors and sources of antimicrobial resistance. And would also favor horizontal gene transfer between uh, bacteria from different habitats. We already know that um, the both um, gastrointestinal tract and urinary tract pathogens are abundant in sewage. And it's thought that wastewater creates the condition that will heighten the risk of horizontal gene transfer between both groups of pathogens. at uh, the situation in Nigeria. Um, Nigeria's population of about 200 million is about 20% of that of Sub-Saharan Africa. But the current practices for water and wastewater management are insufficient to ensure safe and basic uh, sanitation. By the end of 2020, only 54% of um, people in sub-Saharan Africa use safe drinking water. Now, I want you to imagine Nigeria, imagine a country where cattle feces contaminate surface water, contaminate surface water because cattle is free at free range and institute had watering happens. Um, imagine uh, the untreated sewage is dumped into rivers and streams. Only, actually the only about for four, four municipal wastewater treatment plants. Three of them are small and located in the universities. And untreated sewage, untreated surface water and wastewater actually are used for fresh produce irrigation. Imagine also a country where the highest number of people practicing open defecation, practicing open defecation dwell in 14, um, yeah, as people only 14 out of 774 local government areas in Nigeria are considered open defecation free. Thank you. Now imagine also where the virtually all antibiotics are available over the for over the counter purchase and use without prescription, of course. Yes. 
the over 210 million Nigerians, you, if you like, are all doctors and pharmacists. Then imagine also we have substandard antimicrobial products uh, everywhere. I personally had a particular experience of, um, of needing to treat multi-drug resistant E. coli. And I bought meropidin, a carbapidin that should be rat resultant, about 6,000 naira, and only to get, have been treated and without result. Then it was that we were able to buy the original one, which cost 12,000 steeds per ample, and, uh, and it was until then. So when we treat with uh, substantial drugs, it will be adding to, to the pressure. Um, my interest actually, I want to talk about selected studies. Our work began in the Northern part of Nigeria, um, where we uh, worked on surface waters um, that receive, uh, uh, um, one of them is uh, the Kubani River that receives uh, sewage from the Abad Bello University Wastewater Treatment Plant. And we were able to, 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 to show that 79, 42.9% of the 184 E. coli isolates we are resistant to four or more antibiotics. And that's on the high side. Then um, about um, much later, we still were able to publish the work and, and we showed that uh, following our initial reports that that sewage treatment plant was renovated. Uh, but um, we do not know how efficient the treatment plant is today. We've also done a recent study here that we published in 2020 um, that looked at the wastewater treatment plant here at the University of Nigeria where I work. And the story is still not different. The high resistances we observed in among wastewater E. coli isolates with multi-drug resistance a multi-drug resistant pattern ranging from three to 17 drugs. Um, so, and we have current outbreak. I don't even know whether we'll still be calling cholera, talking of outbreak or say that cholera is endemic in Nigeria. It's always there, but then when the number increases. So as we speak, there is an ongoing outbreak and cholera has, you know, killed more people in Nigeria in 2021 than COVID-19. And uh, as of 21st November, a total of 100, over 100,000 cases have been reported and over 3,500 deaths have occurred with a case fatality of 3.4%. Um, the, the outbreak has been reported in 32 of the Nigeria statistics space, as well as in the federal capital territory. So what are the factors um, driving this spread? Um, one is that we really don't have um, a standardized government-backed uh, AMR surveillance system. Again, the open defecation that will have affect surface water. And the use of wastewater treatment plants that we have are just so limited. Even where they occur, it's not all the households that are connected. And then there is the issue of poor operation and maintenance of existing infrastructure. That would be the case with the one we have here at the University of Nigeria. Um, okay, just to capture it, um, Nigeria, you, can, you could see that Nigeria is about four times the population of South Africa. And yet we have only four municipal wastewater treatment plants here in Nigeria, four functional. They are not even, it just the, the society largely depends on the sewage um, soccer waste system and septic tanks. Then also there are the issues of pit latrines and dilapidated uh, pipelines that deteriorate you know, groundwater. Then, and this that I must share with us, um, continued discharge of untreated sewage into surface water. A sewage is not treated and just tankers will abstract from the, 
from the septic tanks and just dump them in surface water. So what are we doing? Um, we were able to establish a collaborative relationship with Abuja Environmental Protection Board, and we are looking at, we are studying um, the Abuja Wastewater Treatment Plan. An aspect of the study uh, the, is the uh, assessment of the role of wastewater treatment plant in the dissemination of vibro vibro species and antibiotic resistant genes, a case study of Wupa plants. And our aim was to evaluate the potential, the reservoir potential rules as that. And we are using metagenomic tools. Uh, our study has already shown that um, there is a lot of relationship between the, the strains found in the waste treatment plant and, and that of the receiving Upa River. Um, this reveals also the functional metabolic genes uh, that have during the wet season. Usually that's the period that the cholera outbreak um, prevails. Now um, we got 82 vibrio cholera isolates. And with the distribution, you could see, uh, but from the influence and uh, is the response, the, the, the susceptibility to different, uh, <clears throat> there is 100% resistant to metronid as well, but then some um, susceptibility, resistance level is lower when we consider uh, ciprofloxacin and tetracycline. But we must mention that uh, high levels of multi drug resistance were reported. Uh, we are reporting multi high levels of multi drug resistance. And as you could see from here, um, this the percentage with MD are compared to the total number of isolates um, is actually high and expectedly it is lower at the upstream section showing that um, the discharge, which is high, has affected that. So this is the downstream um, where we are having almost 60% um, level of uh, multi-drug resistance. Okay, in all the sites, multi-drug isolates, we are isolated. And um, the percentage multi-drug resistance is slightly higher in the implant than at the F-train. So again, we are looking at, we are all, a part of what we are doing is that we're expanding beyond, since we don't have lots of wastewater treatment plant and surface waters are receptions of, of waste. We are expanding beyond wastewater treatment plants to, to look at surface water samples. And um, in this particular study, we are looking at the impact of, um, we, study the Asata River as one of the major rivers that drain Enugu metropolis. And we're evaluating the microbiological quality and the potential possible health risks, um, the water that is used for domestic and agricultural purposes. And these were the streams of E. coli that we isolated, Vibrio cholera, of course, um, uh, the toxigenic Vibrio cholera pre predominating. And it's important for me to mention that the current, the outbreak that just happened from July and is subsided now in Enugu State was actually traceable um, <clears throat> to that river because we know that this as, as new artisan market community uh, depends on, on the water. The river runs, uh, just the market actually on the, on the, the shed, watersheds of the river. Uh -huh. Moving forward, you could see um, the, the, res <coughs> the percentage of isolates that were resistant and those that, that were, you know, toxigenic and not toxigenic strains. And you see that the toxigenic vibrio strains, we actually 
should higher level of, of resistance. Um, we also now look for antibiotic resistant genes. And um, again, we detected more, more of these antibiotic resistant genes, most higher, <clears throat> more number of genes were detected in, in isolates. In, in a greater number of the isolates that we are vibriotoxidinic than that. This is the- uh, <clears throat> Sorry, Professor, uh, we seem to be running out of time. Uh, could you please um, kindly summarize and so we can uh, keep with the schedule, please? Okay, okay. Thank, you thank you very much. Also, we are doing our best to go beyond the laboratory into community engagement. Um, we have this uh, Health Humanities Initiative that allows us to, to actually, and the initiative has four key components. We do water sanitation and hygiene survey, pre and post and post intervention. Then we have a theater for development team that, that uh, engages the community to, to do public health education and create awareness on wash and AMR matters. And then we also um, train them on affordable water treatment. We have a collaboration with um, Bob Metcalf. Uh, and then we also collecting water samples that we analyze in the lab. So we started this and we done an outreach this year at a rural community in Enugu State called Ichiago. And it's interesting to see that um, even though um, of 76 percent of the population depend uh, do open defecation, yet it's a community that depends on, on surface water, small streams and unprotected springs for water. That has led us really into um, a collaboration with an NGO that um, is interested in reaching out to. What are the challenges we are having? Poor funding of research and lack of equipment and uh, institutional support, even when you want to pursue grants, is lacking. There is this issue also, and that's particularly why I'm excited about this. There is poor intra-Africa collaborations. And unstable electricity is a matter here with us in Nigeria. It can heavily hinder one's research. But uh, well, how do we hope the challenges need to be dealt with? And there is need for establishment of collaborative relationship within Africa and, and the pursuit of multi-institution grants um, environmental surveillance should be critical. And as this is happening, we want to actually believe that, that this platform is critical. Of course, future return, we need to begin to look at how what we are doing, we have done at Ichiago would help in solving wash related problems using theater. Then there are lots of shallow wells. There's not a lot of research on the road that these shallow wells spray play in MR spread. Okay, but then there is issue of are there really the nucleic acid standard for water? We know we have counts for, for pathogens that show water quality. If we are discussing uh, AMR, we need to begin to look in terms of um, nucleic acids in, in aquatic environments. And does organic matter favor AGT, the biofilms, and this area of micro plastics, a lot more studies needs to be done. Again, we are saying that to what extent is the horizontal gene transfer between Euro pathogens and, and enteric pathogens? These are places that needs to be looked at. In conclusion, water focused approaches are key for detecting spread in populations and preventing mass spread to everywhere. I want to acknowledge um, Sam Coleridge. His poem actually triggered my interest in water, who said, water, water everywhere, and a drop to drink. I want also to thank, I appreciate my, our, our research group members, Dr. Ozochi. These are the students um, that did this work, Dr. Chizoba Ozochi, and, um, and the two that are still studying. Stella Madek and the Nyabasi Ivanga. Um, right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. much. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much. Um, that was very, very interesting from a, from a very specific perspective. Um, we'll discuss this more in the Q&A.
Our next speaker today is Dr. Uh, Carl Peterson. Um, he has extensive research experience in antibiotic resistance, microbiome studies, bacterial infections in animals, and bacterial zoonosis. Research and diagnostics in antibiotic resistance have included monitoring and surveillance of, of resistance in animal pathogenic and zoonotic bacteria. Studies on bacterial infections have included a long array of animals, including production animals, aquaculture fish, companion animals, and wildlife. While studies on zoonotic bacteria have mainly been focused on Salmonella, Campylobacter, and MRSA. The research has included resistance epidemiological studies, among other things based on whole genome sequencing. Research in microbiome has included mapping of the intestinal microbiota in broilers and how their composition is affected by different feeds or by infection. Other microbiome studies have analyzed the composition of the microbiota on skin and nose in pigs, as well as the effects of antibiotic treatment on the microbiome and resistome in pigs, treated or not with antibiotics. Thank you so much, doctor. Um, do not feel rushed. We can steal a minute or two from the Q&A and the tea break. I will focus my talk here on monitoring of antimicrobial resistance uh, in one health uh, perspective, and that's because it's my laboratory here in Uppsala, which is running the, uh, the national surveillance program for antimicrobial resistance in animals and in, in food. Ideally, uh, if it's a One Health uh, surveillance program, um, we should have surveillance programs for antimicrobial resistance, both in humans, in food, in animals, and uh, in the environment. Um, and I have this uh, slide here showing all the, uh, the, the, the arrows uh, connecting uh, the, the different compartments, and it can be much more complicated than that. The, uh, this, the slide that uh, William Gaze uh, showed earlier was much more complicated. Uh, I've chosen to make this one, which is a, a bit uh, less complicated. We have the human reservoir, the animal reservoir, and the food reservoir of antimicrobial resistance and resistance uh, genes, and then the, the uh, environmental reservoir also, concerning the, the human reservoir, there are um, surveillance programs in place, both at uh, a national and uh, international uh, perspective in Europe. For example, there is this uh, EARS net, European Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Network, and at the, at the more international or global level as uh, programs uh, run by the WHO, the GLASS uh, program. Concerning the, the food national, the surveillance of antimicrobial resistance in, in food in, in Europe, we have programs for that, which are regulated by the European Union. Uh, so that, that's uh, stipulated in the European legislation quite simply. Um, the Commission implementing decision here on monitoring and reporting of antimicrobial resistance in zoonotic and commensal, commensal bacteria. Um, so, that, so that stipulates that all EU member states have to do uh, a surveillance program or monitoring program of antimicrobial resistance in certain uh, bacterial species. Uh, and it also stipulates exactly which bacteria we have to look for and exactly which methods we have to use uh, for that. In addition to this uh, uh, surveillance program, there is a monitoring uh, on zoonosis and zoonotic agents also directed by the uh, European Commission. So much, much of this uh, uh, surveillance in, in food and food animals that is actually uh, regulated by EU uh, laws so the, the bacteria that we are monitoring is uh, the both zoonotic and commensal bacteria. For the zoonotic bacteria, it's Salmonella, Campylobacter, both the Juni and, and coli. And for the commensal bacteria, it's uh, E. coli, uh, not pathogenic E. coli, but randomly selected 
uh, E. coli from uh, healthy animals, and likewise for the Enterococci, Enterococcus faecum, and Enterococcus uh, faecalis. So one may say that this is not a surveillance, um, even though it's in food animals and in, in food, it's not really a surveillance of bacteria from animals, uh, but more the more it's more um, illustrating the the flow of or the exposure of antimicrobial resistance uh, and resistant uh, bacteria uh, that are in, in humans from animals. When it comes to the animal reservoir, the bacteria that makes animals uh, sick, we have much less uh, knowledge. Um, in Sweden, we are so lucky that we have a, um, a combined uh, monitoring program where we both have the, the uh, surveillance uh, of antibiotics in, in, in humans and in uh, this EU regulated uh, program. And then we have what we call the SWAMPAT program, which is a monitoring of antimicrobial resistance in bacteria, which are pathogenic for animals. So we have a united program here, but far from all countries uh, have that. It's actually very few countries which have that. Um, However, in the European uh, Union, we are now a group of uh, laboratories uh, which are trying to establish such a um, surveillance network uh, for bacteria that really are pathogenic uh, for, uh, for animals and not just uh, for humans. We call it ears net, uh, ears vet, uh, as opposed to the ears net system, which is uh, operating in, in, in humans. So that would be then a combined, so to speak, uh, surveillance program for, um, for human clinical bacteria, for veterinary clinical bacteria, and for the bacteria, commensal and zoonotic bacteria that uh, are transmitted between animals and uh, humans. The, the Swedish program, and that also goes for this uh, year's VET program that some of us are trying to, to build up now, uh, there is no uh, component of antimicrobial resistance in the environment, uh, not whatsoever. When it comes to the, uh, to the environment, it's much more complicated to have a surveillance program. There is actually a, a working group under the uh, EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, which has suggested to expand the, uh, the EFSA surveillance program, the EU surveillance program with um, a surveillance in um, environmental samples, but it's very difficult to, to identify what that should be because a surveillance program for in environment, the big questions and uh, the previous speakers have already uh, um, um, mentioned that also what should we mon monitor and why should we do it? Um, from a, an EFSA perspective, the reason why we should um, monitor it is to measure the influx of antimicrobial resistance, uh, resistance genes and pa resistant pathogens into, uh, into humans and into animals. So what should, what should we monitor? Should we monitor wastewater, surface water, seawater? recreational water, whatever water um, bodies there are, or should we more focus on, on soil, maybe wildlife, or something that the EFSA working group uh, suggested was that uh, at least for a start, we could start to look at uh, antimicrobial resistance in such products that were taken more or less directly from uh, from land, uh, agriculture fields, or from, uh, from the sea, such as fresh produce eaten raw, not any heat treatment, or bivalve mussels, uh, oysters, uh, for example, which are also eaten without any uh, previous uh, heat treatment. So that could be a, a start, but um, again, there's a long way because before we can have a, a surveillance program for the environment, which makes sense because if it makes sense, we'll need to be able to uh, compare results from one country to another, maybe even from one continent to another. Um, and we are, we are not nearly there yet, uh, which methods to use, what to look for. 
protocols and, and how to sample and, and so on. Uh, there's a very long way to go before we have a, uh, an operating uh, surveillance program for, uh, for, the, uh, for the environment. The next thing I will talk a little bit about is a, a research program which has just started and where we are involved. It's uh, called Pairwise, um, dispersal of antibiotic resistance and antibiotics in water ecosystems, um, an influence on livestock and aquatic wildlife. It has started now in September uh, this year and will end in uh, August uh, 20, 2024. It's a um, JPI AMR program with those uh, uh, partners here, there's uh, the National Veterinary Institute uh, is the coordinator and uh, I'm the official co coordinator at the moment. In addition to that, we have a research group from uh, from Norway and uh, from another group from from Sweden, from uh, Linköping University and a Spanish uh, partner, two Tunisian partners, uh, one of which is actually going to make a talk here later this afternoon, and then a, a partner from Uganda. So, so the hope is that uh, we will be able to investigate the uh, dispersal of antibiotic resistance genes, uh, uh, resistant bacteria, resistance genes and antibiotics downstreams of wastewater treatment plants and have the, um, the opportunity to compare different geographical areas um, which also means different uh, climate zones, but also different types of water. Uh, when we look at um, at uh, um, surface water, it can be sea water, it can be um, river water and, and lake water. And an important role is uh, to look at uh, the role of wildlife, and we're going to focus on wild birds, uh, migratory birds, in the dispersal of antibiotic resistant bacteria and resistance genes um, spreading to, for example, to agriculture fields and, and how that's taken up uh, by uh, grazing livestock in these, um, in these fields. So it will give us some information about the flow of antibiotic uh, resistant bacteria and resistance genes um, from wastewater to uh, wildlife to uh, livestock and we are not going to look at the the food made from the livestock but that would be the, the next point to, to see how it spills into back into human uh, health we have these um work packages here the work package one is to look at the methods and protocols and so on because and that is what we are working on right now uh, focusing very strongly on, on the, the protocols and harmonization because we need to make sure that all the partners in the consortium are using exactly the same uh, protocols to sample and to analyze uh, the samples to make everything uh, comparable. And the other, um, the, the other uh, work packages is to look at the dispersal of um, antibiotic uh, resistant bacteria uh, downstream of, of uh, wastewater tra uh, treatment plants and uh, look at um, antibiotic resistance in uh, grazing cattle and, and water and how they are um, disseminated uh, through uh, wild birds. I think that, has, that was uh, my time as is up now. So just a map here to show the uh, areas uh, that are involved and where we are planning uh, to sample. It's uh, in, in, in Norway, Svalbard and Lillestrøm, and, and in Sweden, we have three places we want to, to sample. Tunisia, there are also uh, places to sample, and in, in Uganda, uh, it's both a river and, and lake uh, water that uh, we are going uh, to sample and, and to analyze. Thank you for listening. The next part of this workshop will be to move into a uh, Q&A session. I encourage everyone to please, if you have any questions regarding the first four speakers' topics um, and the collective theme, please submit them and then we can discuss them with the speakers. Um, to start off, uh, I'm going to 
uh, throw out some general points that I picked up from these um, um, from these talks, and then try to summarize them um, so that we can discuss what it means. So one major topic that popped out was the One Health Perspective. And to the, um, as a, a collaborative approach, what does that mean to the general public in terms of combating antimicrobial resistance? Um, if one of the, the panelists would mind addressing that. I can have a go. Yes, um, please. I'm, I think to the general public, it probably doesn't mean anything. Um, so that's the answer. And I think actually to a lot of pol um, policymakers and even scientists, it's not clear exactly what it means. Um, you know, and I think it's because the, the concept of One Health has evolved from really being confined to animal health and human health. Um, and really the envir environmental sector has always been a bit of a poor relation. And in terms of AMR, it's almost, it's almost like the environment is the sink, but you know this implied two-way transfer and origin of resistance. Most people wouldn't think about the origins of resistance in 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 natural environmental communities. You know they just think about maybe cycling through the environment or it, uh, thinking of it as a, as a sink. So I think very few people, or, or relatively few people, fully understand really what it means in the context of AMR. Does anyone want to add to that? Yes, Dr. Peterson? Yeah, I can add. When I was uh, a student, uh, we called it veterinary public health. <laughs> it's not quite the same, actually. Um, but but uh, veterinary public health is exactly about the zoonosis and how animals and food, how they spill into, uh, into uh, human health, both with pathogenic bacteria and viruses and parasites and so on, and also antimicrobial resistance. Um, the change to one Health, uh, I think, is more or less um, is caused by the the understanding that everything is everything is connected. Um, so we need to include more than just human health and animal health. It's also environmental health. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. I think so. <laughs> um, the the next thing that also popped out quite a lot was prioritizing risks in terms of antimicrobial resistance, because we see risks of transmission, that's been discussed, and we see risks of infection. How do we prioritize which of these types of risks should, be, should take priority on a, in a research and governmental um, perspective? Perhaps, uh, Professor Carlos, you want to uh, provide some insight with that? Uh, Rulof, that's a difficult one. You've seen that all the other panelists were, were quiet on it. Um, it, it is um, prioritizing, um, I mean, as, as soon, and, and I specifically refer to um, death rates and mortality and stuff like that. As soon as uh, the um, the risk will have a terminal effect, then I mean that should be sort of a, a starting point where one would um, prioritize that uh, specific risk. Um, but in terms of of um, the exposures that we have, in terms of the uh, AMR, uh, that is that is not that acute. Um, we get that exposure now, and then all of a sudden everything is over, and you get buried. Um, <clears throat> I think that is that is a, a an important point for discussion, and an important uh, aspect to look at, and to to really make sure that we we get the right priorities for um, uh, whatever we are doing. Thank you. Perfect. Um, one thing that I would like to point, uh, yes, yes, uh, Dr. Peterson. Oh, sorry, you're muted. <laughs> um, no, I'm not muted. 
when it when it comes to uh, zoonotic uh, bacteria like uh, especially salmonella but also to some extent um, listeria and uh, campylobacter there has been developed um, programs to use uh, whole genome sequencing or other typing methods um, and then do source attribution so we know more or less how big a proportion of salmonella for example that infect humans how big a proportion of those come from eating chicken, how much come from eating eggs, how much come from, from eating pork and so on. Um, when it comes to antimicrobial resistance, we simply don't know that. Um, there is not any uh, source attribution system uh, in place. I know there's a research group uh, who are working on this. Um, so I think, and the source attribution systems for zoonotic bacteria, that exactly, they are exactly used to prioritize what should we focus on to in, install uh, intervention, um, to, yeah, to install proper interventions? And we don't have that for, for antimicrobial resistance. Um, lately, we are focusing a lot of ESBL, for example, but as uh, the, the paper that uh, William Gaze also mentioned earlier, when you look at whole genome sequencing of ESBLs from human clinical samples and from animals, they are really not uh, very much linked. So it's, we may, even though we find ESPLs in both compartments, they, they, may, they may not be um, uh, connected uh, to some uh, large extent. And, and that, is, that is what we would need to know more about. Yes, um, uh, uh, Professor Gaze? Yeah, I, I think just to really simplify it, if you think about um, AMR in the clinic, you know, and really, we focus on stewardship, so reducing usage, and we focus on infection control, which is reducing transmission. So really, I don't think it's any, it's not any more complex than that conceptually, but in practice, of course it is. But we need to reduce usage in other, in other sectors. We need to reduce, um, you know, uh, dissemination of, of antibiotics into the environment. Um, and we also need to reduce transmission, which is, you know, infection control in the clinic is the same as hand washing in the community, or it's the same as treating wastewater. It's, it's, it's really all the same thing. You've just got selection and you've got transmission. Those are the two drivers. Of course, which, where you start first, I guess, is maybe you have to have some cost benefit analysis that you implement the cheapest but most effective interventions first to reduce this connectivity between the three One Health compartments. And also, you know, the, the presence of the selective agents, which the antibiotics, also in those three compartments. Um, so I guess it has to be done based on what's, what is going to have the most effect for the least investment, um, at least it's in the start when you start prioritizing them. Um, I think, you know, we shouldn't get caught up about necessarily um, trying to work out exactly how you attribute, you know, usage in pig farming to emergence in the clinic, because we know that all antibiotic usage is, is providing a selective pressure, which is driving emergence of genes. So even if those genes are different in animal strains, we don't know where those genes came from in the human pathogens. They may well have come from animals in the past, but just because they're, they're different now and don't overlap much, it doesn't actually tell us about the risk of this emergence of resistance. You just have to reduce selection and reduce transmission. I know it seems like uh, that's oversimplistic, but sometimes we overcomplicate it as well. Yes, I think that's an important point, especially considering uh, now coming to, to what it's about is, is, is the environmental impact. Um, should our antibiotic, our AMR, is AMR in the environment uh, carry a higher risk than in the clinical sector, or is it simply a mirror of what's happening in the clinical sector? I think that's a a bit more a touchy subject. <laughs> I, I would say it's the other way around. It's, you know, what, what is happening in the, in the clinic is mirroring what happens in the environment because those, those genes, these transferable genes, they don't originate in the clinic. They don't originate. Mutations do, but the, many of the genes that we're worried about in, say, gram negatives, they come from environmental bacteria. They evolved way before, you know, even animals had guts in some cases. So I think. It's tempting to think it's mirroring, you know, what happens in the clinic in the environment, but it's not even as simple as that. It's a, it's a, it's a two-way thing, isn't it? So you have 
genes that, are, that originate in the environment, they move into pathogens, they then further diversify, and then they come back into the environment. So it's very a two-way thing. Hmm. And That's all term, right. sorry, and yeah, and just I was just picking up something else in terms of impacts on the environment. You know, we don't necessarily think that much. You know, when we talk about environmental health, what's the impact of AMR on the environment? You know, arguably AMR gives resilience to microbial communities that are, you know, being um, stressed by pollutants. So it allows them to survive, doesn't it? But we don't really know what the impact of antimicrobial pollution and AMR has on the functioning of microbial ecosystems and carbon cycling and, you know, all the nutrient cycling and plant growth. But that's, that's not really why we focus on the environment. We're focusing on the environment because of its relationship and its key component um, to, um, you know, to the clinical problem. Very few people actually focus on the impacts of AMR and antimicrobial pollution on environmental ecosystems because the funding is not there for that type of work. It's there for understanding how the environment contributes to the clinical problem. Yes. I think this discussion we can continue in the Q&A. We have one um, question for Professor uh, Sugar. Um, in recent times, there has been much uh, discussions on the ban of open grazing, which until today, the federal government of Nigeria has refused or is unwilling to adopt. Why is there no scientific argument driving the call for the ban of open grazing of cattle, which you mentioned one of the drivers of AMR? Uh, we, we can't hear you, Professor. <laughs> yes, yes, now we can hear you. Okay, thank you. I actually want to say that um, Nigeria is a very complex environment, um, both it politically and, um, and religiously, and that determines a lot of things. Um, so you see the struggles that are there. Um, if I should speak um, politically, let me first say that Nigeria is where people are working hard to sustain what is not working. Um, the structure is not working, yet they are saying they want one Nigeria. There are lots and lots of things. Uh, as I speak with you, our educational system, research is not funded. We do meaningful research when we find collaborators outside this place. The, 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 the government and the agencies that should be involved and not, do not have the, the commitment, the seriousness that is required. So coming back to the open grazing thing that is asked, um, they have linked it to religion. They feel that the Fulani is who are the who do the open grazing, whose major business is cattle rearing, that it is their cultural entitlement, that is their way of life. And so, and the government is, is supporting them. So nobody is listening to, to, to those who are arguing that, can they have ranches? Can people restrain the animals and, and raise them in restricted environment? After all, is their private business but because the, the leadership of the country is from that part of the, of, of the world, so they just find it difficult to listen. As I speak with you, I can't connect with the world through Twitter because the government is angry that Twitter queried what they posted. So we have been banned from the use of Twitter. Well, I'm just lucky that I'm in Anangra State. Last month in, in Kaduna State, where one of my collaborators, uh, they were for three months, they were, they were restricted from the use of the phone. They just blocked and kept them in communicado in the, in the bit that they are fighting insurgents that um, the, the bandits who are terrorists, they choose not to call them terrorists and call them bandits, that they are using the phone to connect. Why not use that technology to track them down rather than stop the entire society uh, from, from connecting with the world. So um, all we are doing here really is try hard to be scientists as we ought to be. I did talk about the problem of um, electricity. Sometimes the reason I, I left for South Africa for my PhD was because you put up a culture in the lab and they take electricity. You wanted to have it at 44. You end up culturing at room temperature. Is that the, the, the temperature? How do you report 
would that be science? Would that be, or would the scientists not have conscience to then write off a paper and say, I incubated this? And you raise issues, well, we're engaging the government, but I'm sure also um, that I appreciate the question that was raised, but I'm sure also that the world knows that for a long time, they asked your academic staff union, we keep going on strike again and again, because the government just refuses um, to do the right thing. This may not even be, in some cases also, uh, funds are actually mismanaged, but um, we just want to hope and believe that um, they will begin to listen uh, because we must make contribution. The population of Nigeria, Nigeria is critical when we come to Africa in terms of population. And whatever that is happening here would impact and Africa will impact the group. And I think um, we need all the support we can get. Thank you so much. Yes, our research must definitely um, uh, convince governments, governmental legislations to, uh, to try to solve this issue. Thank you, panelists, I not so to much. want to listen to anybody. Sorry? I said they seem never to want to listen to anybody. <laughs> Hopefully we can change that as researchers and scientists. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you so much, panelists, for your uh, input. Um, I think everyone ha has um, so much to learn in the future, and we hope our research can keep on growing. We will now continue with the rest of the workshop, starting with our um, first speaker. All right, our next speaker is uh, Rene Street, Dr. Rene Street, from the South African Medical Research Council, Environment and Health Research Unit from South Africa. Dr. Street is a specialist scientist and deputy director at the Environment and Health Research Unit of the South African Medical Research Council. She leads the Persistent Toxic Substance Program. Over the past decade, Dr. Street's research has focused on various aspects of heavy metal exposure and the impact on human health. Dr. Street has a keen interest in public health issues and policy development. As a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Street has been instrumental in setting up the SAMRC Wastewater Surveillance and Research Program to monitor SARS-CoV-2 RNA trends. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we look forward to your presentation. You may share your screen. So today I'm just going to share um, some insights into um, the building of our oh sorry um, the building of our wastewater based um, epidemiology program within South Africa, and just some insights into lessons learned. So um, wastewater testing has been used successfully to monitor a variety of um, diseases throughout um, um, uh, over the decades, including polio, norovirus, and hepatitis. SARS-CoV-2 can be shed in the feces of individuals with both symptomatic and asymptomatic infections. And that is why the wastewater surveillance can be a leading indicator of change in COVID-19 burden in communities at as it represents a pooled community sample. Now, access to clinical testing is a major problem in low, middle, low and middle income countries. And the recent uh, modeling done by WHO suggests that six in seven COVID-19 infections in Africa go undertake, undetected. So currently wastewater surveillance is a COVID-19 indicator that's independent of health seeking behaviors and access to clinical testing. So for this reason and many more reasons, Wastewater surveillance went from being marginalized to mainstream in a very short uh, time frame. Currently, um, as of 1st of October, it, become, it became mandatory for all um, countries in the EU to um, undertake wastewater surveillance for SARS-CoV-2. Our program was set up in a classic post-normal science situation where the facts are uncertain, stakes are high, and decisions are extremely urgent but our program developed with agility and adaptability. In March of last year, we um, were very interested in the research done in the Netherlands where they first isolated the SARS-CoV-2 RNA um, at Schiphol Airport. And very quickly, um, a team of our scientists got together to start planning to see how we could do this in the South African context and develop an early warning system 
uh, for SARS-CoV-2. In June, we um, did the lab proof of concept and we isolated and quantified the SARS-CoV-2 from the wastewater. And soon after that, we rolled out our field proof of concept study, which was undertaken in Cape Town. And this was to test out the field logistics um, to see how it would all, how we could put it all together, uh, what teams we needed and what level of expertise. Shortly after, we started extending our sites, um, including more and more wastewater treatment plants, as well as uh, including uh, extending with um, invitations to our partner laboratory. And earlier this year, from a small project, we became a um, formalized wastewater surveillance and research program at the South African Medical Research Council. In early July last year, we had some really key questions we needed to answer. Um, so hence, we, after we detected the SARS-CoV-2 in our wastewater, we set about our proof of concept. We sampled from all of the 24 wastewater treatment plants within the city of Cape Town over a six week period. Um, on the left, um, you can see here, this was um, in July where um, the, we were just in the middle of our first COVID-19 wave. And I'm just, my curse is jumping. Okay, um, you can see the trend of the COVID-19 case numbers coming down slowly. And this is in line with what we saw in our wastewater signal from the beginning of July moving across six weeks to um, August, where we could see our um, the SARS-CoV-2 signal in the wastewater, which was extremely high and um, indicated by the more red shades and the dark brown, slowly moved towards being um, almost um, fully green towards um, August, which showed us that the signal of SARS-CoV-2 from the, you know, the higher numbers we saw um, at the height of the, um, the first wave really did come down together, um, matching up very nicely with what we saw in the clinical data. Um, during this time, we also used it to develop our SOPs and to refine our field yeah, and lab guides. Once we had answers to some of our critical questions, we designed an outline for our program focusing on six elements. Um, so the wastewater surveillance uh, we do is driven by key research questions, including aspects of genomics, variants of concern, um, and yeah, constant uh, questions that um, we keep on having to, um, yeah, we are very keen to continue to explore. Of course, with our wastewater sampling, we've got strategic selection of sites, both in urban areas, peri-urban and uh, rural settings as well. Our laboratory analysis um, is undertaken by our reference laboratory in Cape Town at the MRC. And um, yeah, they are reference lab and they ensure that there's standardization across our program, um, as well as um, they have a keen eye on the, the quality control aspect. Now capacity development was always a major goal of our program as we started. So we work um, predominantly with historically disadvantaged or under-resourced institutions within South Africa and provide um, skills um, development and training to their staff and students. We, as soon as we um, started uh, gathering more data, we realized that, um, you know, we were communicating with our key stakeholders, but we wanted to make sure that this was, the information was available to the public. So we set up a public facing dashboard, which is updated weekly to ensure that uh, many people have access uh, to the to the data, um, to the information that we are then able to share. And of course, um, research uptake and um, public engagement is also an important element. We are currently sampling in 72 uh, wastewater treatment plants every week uh, across South Africa's four provinces. And as of next year, we will include the Free State and KwaZulu-Natal. So we work with uh, partner universities. We don't courier any samples. Um, we capacitate uh, locally at the universities, and um, as yeah, in the other two states uh, provinces, we're adding. We'll be also including two new partner universities. Currently, our catchment population is just under eight million, and will grow with the addition of the next of uh, the provinces. 
So we have a, a, a program uh, that run, runs on a weekly rotation. So Monday morning, very early, our, our field teams go out um, and sample across all of our sites. And they deliver the samples um, to our labs by midday so that the lab teams can then take over to do the lab, um, the SARS-CoV-2 extraction, as well as the quantification of the SARS-CoV-2. Um, on Wednesday morning, there's a lab huddle. The teams, all teams get together, interrogate the data, discuss any issues they may have had, and the, the information or the data is then signed off by the reference lab. Um, the data then goes to the stats team who prepares, uh, pr prepares graphs and maps, uh, packages information to key stakeholders and updates the MRC dashboard. And this is, we try to do this as soon as we can um, early on midweek. So it allows then the, our key um, health uh, stakeholders um, at, to, to undertake interventions if need be at facility and community levels. So to share some of the, our findings, um, from early November, we started collecting from all 24 wastewater uh, treatment plants in Cape Town, covering the entire city. And this graph shows um, the timeline, which was the start of our second wave. And it's clear to see that our wastewater signal, um, which is the median of all of the wastewater plants across the city, um, uh, prefaces the, the cases, which is in red. So this is the COVID-19 case data. And again, our signal declines, which is what you want to see before the case numbers decline. Um, so this, um, we can see here that the SARS-CoV-2 number in our wastewater, the maximum in the second wave got to around 3,000 copies per mil. But when we compare it now, moving on, this was wave two to our wave three, we were very surprised to see how the signal changed um, dramatically. So the third wave was driven by the Delta variant, um, which of course showed a very different picture. You can see here, here's the, the height of the wave two with the height of the wave three being a lot um, higher. So obviously after much discussion about whether that was um, affected by the, the COVID-19 testing algorithms or may um, more asymptomatic people, we always triangulate the data with all sorts uh, to better understand our patterns. And at this, and in this case with the Delta variant, there was a higher shedding per case and longer shedding individuals, which we did pick up in our wastewater signal. Um, we're using the PCR genotyping to investigate the variants of concern. And up to May of this year, the beta variant, which drove our second wave, was dominant. But 10 weeks later, if you focus on this week 30, um, the Delta variant uh, was dominant. We did retrospective analysis um, of our samples, and we could identify exactly where and when the Delta variant was introduced in the city of Cape Town. So this is using a, a rapid targeted PCR approach and the results are available within 24 hours. We also do monitoring of um, the residences at some universities. Um, this is a, a PhD student, um, Nolu, Nolu's project. Uh, one of the aspects is to monitor the uh, residents at one of the universities in South Africa. And what was picked up by Nolu's data um, was that there was an increase in the wastewater signal um, which then, um, after feeding back this information to the, um, to the university, the campus did actually close based on the high um, SARS-CoV-2 signal we were picking up. We're also now tracking wastewater in a couple of our other university campuses as well. Last month, there was an outbreak um, at Chuane University of technology in Gauteng province. And although we are not doing campus surveillance at TUT, the TUT does fall within our catchment of wastewater treatment plants. Um, and Dasport, which you can see here, Dasport wastewater treatment plant is less than 1.5 Ks away from Chuane. So we noticed a week before the announcement of the outbreak um, in Chuane um, that our SARS-CoV-2 signal um, which had been very low, 
was now increasing. And we did it, um, we realized that we'd uh, put this outbreak through our wastewater um, because a week later we did see that steep increase that everybody was talking about. Um, so just to say, even though we weren't uh, actively um, doing the surveillance on the, on the campus, we did still um, notice that outbreak um, at TUT. So we had many weeks of fairly low levels of SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater, um, which was also um, um, happening with many low COVID-19 case numbers. But in mid-November, we saw an increased um, level of volatility in our signal. And when we did a deep dive into the metro data, this is just showing three of the, the metros, we looked at the individual wastewater treatment plants and we could see rising levels of volatility in the SARS-CoV-2 fragments. So we did, um, because of this, there was much debate and discussion within the team, but we issued a media statement who thought this was very important to, to share. Um, and it was picked up by many media and, and um, health departments. And interestingly enough, uh, a week later, um, there was the announcement that they had detected the new variant, which is now known as Omicron. Um, so in line with our increased COVID uh, case numbers, of course, our wastewater signal is also increasing as we enter the fourth wave. We are currently finalizing um, the sequencing of the current samples and later today or early tomorrow morning, we'll issue a press release about um, the um, Omicron in our wastewater. So please watch this space. An important aspect um, of our program that I mentioned was um, um, skills transfer and capacity development. Uh, through setting up this program, it's been an excellent opportunity for collaboration and capacity development. The um, BRIP team, so it's the Biomedical Research and Innovation Platform at the MRC, they provide the SARS-CoV-2 uh, training to all of our partner universities. Uh, it's a three-day face-to-face uh, hands-on training, as well as the weekly support um, thereafter. And they also provide the variant testing, which uh, because it was in the middle of one of the waves, they developed the online um, training for the variant testing, which is now um, being undertaken by our partners as well. So there's so many people involved in this program. This is just a couple from you know the field teams to the lab teams to you know, everything in between. And it really is um, the passion of all of these um, dynamic individuals that everybody's bringing something to this program. And really the passion and drive um, from the, the bigger team is just um, phenomenal. In terms of lesson learned. So what we've realized is, you know, more time points are needed. Um, and we probably will need multiple years of data required to infer seasonal trends. Um, however, each wave is driven by a different variant of concern. So every wave does behave quite differently. Um, in terms of our case data, often uh, it's not matched up by the wastewater treatment plant catchment data. So this is also um, brought about really interesting conversations between sectors that didn't necessarily work closely before and how to overcome these interesting um, challenges. Of course, the case data, which you know people find as the gold standard that you know the case data should be matched to then the wastewater signal, well, the case data only reflects diagnosed cases. Um, during waves, um, testing algorithms change. Um, we had unrest here in July in certain parts of our country, which affected testing. So the testing is, of course, affected um, by many, many dynamics. In terms of the way forward. Um, we do plan to expand our network, um, both in terms of the sites um, that we will be um, yeah, expanding, but also some interesting um, developments for our AMR surveillance, uh, pharmaceuticals and pathogens. So our platform is built on agility and adaptability and set up to expand um, in various um, forms. And in the near future, we're hoping to only monitor the uh, absence of SARS-CoV-2, but um, our network and platform is now set up to do many different exciting things. 
Uh, currently, most of our partner labs have expertise in AMR research. And as of next year, we will be increasing our support uh, to expand our platform to support this area of research. So just my concluding slide with thanks and appreciation to a very big team that is involved in this uh, research program and making it work. And of course, our um, funders and um, various partners. Thanks very much. Next speaker for the session is Dr. Claudia Schlanger from TZW, uh, DVGW Technology Center, Wasser, Germany Water Center, Department of Water, Microbiology. Uh, Dr. Schlanger graduated with Diploma in Engineering at the University of Applied Sciences, Mannheim, Germany in 2005. Since that time, she was part of water microbiology at the TZW, DVGW Technology Center, Wasser, the Germany Water Center as project science. Research topics include significance of antibiotic resistance for raw water quality, elimination of antibiotic resistance during water treatment, use of molecular biological methods to detect pathogenic bacteria and viruses in water, microbial source tracking, and SARS-CoV-2 wastewater surveillance. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, you may share your screen and start your presentation. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me and you can see my slides. Yes, it's perfect. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, as you already mentioned, I want to talk about wastewater surveillance. Um, and we did look for SARS-CoV-2. And first of all, I want to say this was not only my work, but uh, also my colleagues, Rabea Sobak, Johannes Ho, and Andreas team were involved in this study. Okay. Um, here's an overview of the study and uh, what were the ideas and um, what in we investigations we did perform. Um, already at the beginning of the pandemic, it was found that SARS-CoV-2 is excreted in the stool of infected persons. So that's the most important point. So you can find it in wastewater. Um, and then we decided we want to look for that after the first publications from the Netherlands that already were mentioned. And if you took a sample from the wastewater treatment plant from the influent, you can see the spread of the virus in the total population of the corresponding catchment area. Um, and on the other side, if you have the population and you have to do individual testing, you need a lot of tests that you get this, um, any information about the spread of the virus in the population. Um, so the whole idea was to perform this wastewater surveillance, um, collecting samples, uh, in the first step, we wanted to decide which primer probe assays are more suitable for the analysis. Um, then we wanted to do the monitoring and compare the numbers from the wastewater monitoring to the infection numbers. That was the idea where we started. So how was um, it, sorry. Um, yeah, how does it look in the lab? Um, so. We sample 24 hour mixed samples, so composite samples from the wastewater treatment plant implant. Um, then first we get rid of the solid uh, particles in the wastewater because they um, make some trouble. Uh, so therefore a first centrifugation step is performed. Uh, we take the supernatant and make a PIG sodium chloride precipitation. Therefore, we add the substances, incubate them for two hours, and we do a second centrifugation step um, just to get a, big uh, a viral pellet. And this viral pellet is used for automatic RNA and DNA extraction using magnetic beads. Um, the nucleic acids are eluted in 100 microliters, and that's the material we use for DD-PCR analysis. So um, as you know, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA, RNA virus. So we had to transcript the RNA to DNA. So we performed a one-step um, PCR uh, and we use digital droplet PCR. You might perhaps ask why DD-PCR. So that's easy to answer. 
um, because this uh, method had some advantages compared to the quantitative real-time PCR. So we don't, it's absolute quantification. We don't need um, standard controls with known concentration to get uh, a quantitative result. That's one point. The second point is that uh, it's really sensitive and accurate also in the low range concentration. And the third point, it's um, you don't have that many trouble with inhibitory effects compared to real time PCR. So at the beginning of our investigations, we ask ourselves which prime and probe sets are particularly suitable for this sewage surveillance. Um, there were a large number of um, sequences published, um, mainly for clinical diagnostics, but in principle, they can also be used for wastewater monitoring. Uh, and in the first studies for wastewater monitoring, the N1 and ESA were often used. So we decided to use these two assays for sure. Um, so um, that were the one on the left side. And on the other side, um, hand, we decided to go for two further assays. We wanted to uh, check if they are also suitable. That's where we started. We took different samples, uh, analyzed them with these four different assays, um, and then we compared the results. And um, in the upper graphs, you can see uh, the correlation of E over F, E, RDRP, and over F, RDRP are quite good. So we had a really quite uh, good correlation with high, um, with 0.96 or even 0.85. So that's really fine. But if we look um, at the comparison with the N1 gene, you could see there were a lot of outliers here that was difficult to compare and uh, the co correlation was quite bad. So um, that was our first result. In our hands, the N1 assay didn't work that well. We don't know why, but that's why we didn't use it for monitoring in the wastewater. Um, then we decided to go for two additional targets, the NSP3 and NSP9. Um, and in the meantime, there was also a new primer for the RDRP, an optimized primer published. So we decided to change that one. Again, we compared the results. Here are the results shown as box plots. And you can see most of the assays give comparable numbers. Um, there's one exception. So the N1 assay gave higher numbers that I already mentioned. And here we also had um, a lot of outliers. Uh, and the old RDRP primer gave lower numbers, but with the optimized primers, um, it was comparable to the others. So all these different primer assays worked well, um, but we didn't use N1 and the RDRP1 assay for further analysis. So we did the monitoring start at the wastewater treatment plant in Karlsruhe. This is located in the southwest of Germany. Um, it treats the sewage of about 3,700 people, uh, uh, 370,000 people, sorry. Um, and uh, in June the last year, we were ready to start. So the method was established in the lab and we took two samples per week. Um, we took the 24-hour copicide samples, as I already told you. Um, and over this time, we did a lot of analysis now. And the results were instantly communicated to the Corona task force at the city. Here are the results for from June 2020 to June 2021. Uh, in blue, the wastewater results are given, and in red, the active cases per 100,000 inhabitants are shown. And you see at the first view, the curves are quite similar. And if you have a look at it, then you can see that the wastewater surveillance was earlier. So 
there was um, a time advantage. You can see it even better in the next slide. So that's the same graph um, up here. But down, um, you can see we just shifted the infection data. Um, and you can see it fits perfectly. We also did a correlation analysis. And you see quite good numbers for the correlation. So that was really positive, And uh, it was a proof of concept for us. Um, and in the meantime, we um, went on with the analysis. And you can see um, in mid of October, we saw this increase, drastic increase in Germany. So we have a the fourth wave here. Um, and again, the numbers increased also from the clinical diagnostic. And um, at the end of November, there was the peak, so maxima. And uh, afterwards, there is a decrease of the numbers in wastewater. And now you can also see it uh, in the infection numbers. As I already told you, um, we report our findings to the local task managers. Um, and they use it really for the management of the pandemic. Um, so. Um, they also tell it to the local press that they use it. And there was one concrete case um, in February this year. We had really low um, numbers of uh, infections, but uh, still there were restrictions in opening shops and so on. And everyone asked for opening the shops. But then we saw that there is an increase again in the wastewater. And the mayor said, no, we can't open the shops because um, there will be an increase soon. And some days afterwards, they could see, OK, the number increased again. It was a good decision not to open the shops that early. Um, a short summary. Um, so as before, you could see um, the SARS-CoV-2 biomicro monitoring correlates really good with the local infection numbers. And it has um, a time advantage. So um, we have about 10 days before we see the trends. Um, so it's really suitable as early warning system. Um, we say it's good to monitor multiple target genes. So to use different assays, because um, it could always be there that there is a, mut uh, a mutation if there is a new variant circulating. Uh, and then one assay doesn't work anymore. So um, it's better to have a robust uh, method. Um, and you can have this using different target genes. Um, you can also use it for the detection of variants of concern. Um, this was all also mentioned in the talk before. We did this by DDPCR. So we detected specific mutations. And we could see the spread of the alpha variant and also of the delta variant. And in the moment, uh, we check for the Omicron variant. But we couldn't see any signals at the moment in our catchment areas until now. So uh, we are really excited what will happen in the next weeks. And uh, we think this um, wastewater monitoring is a really good tool um, to support the COVID-19 crisis management. So this can really help to handle the pandemic. Uh, we already published some data. So there is some preprint available for um, the Karlsruhe data. Uh, we also uh, monitored some other regions in Germany um, and published this in more or less uh, medical journals. But um, it's also important that the medical sector knows what uh, we can do and uh, what helpful tool we have. Um, then I would like to give you some outlooks now. So um, besides the monitoring of waste uh, viruses, we also um, deal many years uh, with the monitoring of antibiotic resistant genes and also antibiotic resistant bacteria in the aquatic environment. Um, so we had some publications there. Um, there's one example shown here, where we looked in surface water from Germany and also Australia for a um, broad range of different antibiotic resistant genes. 
uh, we could find many of these genes. And um, if you look at the um, B or the CAT2 gene, you can see the differences between the different countries. Uh, and we could explain them by the prescription um, in the countries. So um, we already have some experiments detecting antibiotic resistance in the water. Uh, and we want to use that in the future for wastewater surveillance of antibiotic resistant genes and bacteria. So that will be done in the next uh, months and years, I think. Then I also want to introduce a new project. That's the project ZERA. ZERA stands for surveillance of emerging pathogens and antibiotic resistance resistances in aquatic ecosystems. And within this project, we want to monitor the occurrence and fate of uh, a lot of different parameters. So um, we analyze indicator parameters, indicator viruses, pathogenic viruses, microbial source tracking micros, and also antibiotic resistant genes and ESBL E. coli in um, different model areas. We want to study the dynamics of the antibiotic resistances in Europe and Africa. Uh, we want to see what is the impact of the different climates and of uh, extreme weather events. We want to use the data for microbial risk assessment and for the development of monitoring recommendations. Um, here's an overview of uh, the sample points uh, we want to investigate. So we want to look into different um, wastewater. Uh, we want to check um, what is um, the, um, yeah, the from um, combined sewer basins over uh, retention basins, what is uh, yeah, um, brought into the surface water. Um, and we also want to look for sediments and also for mussels if, uh, if they can be used for integrated monitoring. Um, so we are in total eight partners. Um, so, sorry, <laughs> eight partners. So we have partners from Sweden, France, Spain, Israel, Portugal, and we also have two African partners. Um, every partner um, will look at his own model site and we will use harmonized methods. And that is what we're doing right now. We try to harmonize the methods um, and set up the protocols for the monitoring. Uh, and we are really looking forward to, to start with the um, sampling and the monitoring and get the first results. So we are really looking forward. I want to thank uh, the founders for um, yeah, making the studies possible. I want to thank you for the possibility to show our study here. Um, and I want to thank all here for the kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. I think that talk uh, flowed beautifully from the previous um, talk that we had. Um, now uh, we are a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, we will now move into a tea break up until three o'clock exactly. Um, and please, I would like just like to remind all the panelists um, to take part in the conversation in the question in the Q and A section. Um, ask any question. The panelists can ask them directly from there as well. Um, and since we have a minute and a half until the end of, of um, uh, Dr. Stanger's um, uh, presentation, I have actually one uh, personal curiosity question to ask. Um, but the, using the digital PCR, um, how, how efficient will that be once you're having high, for high throughput analysis, when you're having thousands of samples a day compared to the more conventional qPCR methodology? So um, that might be a problem because, yeah, it's a bit more time consuming, uh, but there are other um, options uh, if you don't use uh, the droplet digital PCR, uh, but there are other platforms like um, the chip systems that um, are less uh, time intensive. So this work also for high throughput PCR, I think. So that might be yeah. another option. 
that's very interesting. We actually published an article in 2020 comparing these methods for environmental analysis of antibiotic resistance genes. And um, it, it's, it's interesting to see how this can be further developed to um, surveillance systems. Um, we found that the, uh, even though both methods work function perfectly, we just found that the uh, QPC, conventional QPCR is more realistic in a high throughput environment. But then again, it depends on your infrastructure. So it, it is, it's interesting to talk about. Yeah, that's true. Both methods are really useful, but I think if you want to measure in a really low concentration range, yeah, then absolutely. the digital PCR might be of advantage. So and especially since you also mentioned that it's less prone to effects from inhibition, which wastewater samples definitely do provide. So absolutely adv advantageous in that regard. Yeah, and as we started uh, with the analysis, we had really low numbers um, of infection cases. So um, the number of um, RNR was really low in the wastewater. So that's why we decided to go for DDPCR. That was the reason. <laughs> Excellent point. Perfect rationale. I think so, definitely. All right. All right. Welcome back to the next part of the webinar. Thank you so much for staying with us. We really appreciate your uh, contribution and time and effort you're taking into being here. Um, I'm now going to introduce our next panelist uh, for the final uh, part of this webinar, uh, Dr. Kyla Burns from the Broad Institute and Harvard School of Public Health in the UK. Kyla Burns is a NIH fellow at the Harvard School of Public Health and the Malawi Liverpool Wellcome Trust. Kyla uses genomics to understand viral pathogen dynamics and the host pathogen interaction. She will be giving us a um, a view from the Malawi perspective and the African perspective. Thank you so much for being with us today. And you may start your presentation. Um, yeah, so I'm going to um, discuss what we've been doing in Malawi, and it, and it very much mirrors what Renee and Claudia are doing as well, and, and really actually kind of falls um, in line with what groups in South Africa, including Renee's group, are trying to do. But before I get into our work on SARS-CoV-2, I want to just give a little bit of background about other projects that were going on in Malawi that are not my projects nor my area of expertise, um, but just to kind of give a picture of kind of how we came to the work we've been doing. <coughs> Excuse me. So as Renee and Claudia discussed, there were groups in the US and Europe that very early used wastewater to detect SARS-CoV-2. So we knew it was possible. In Malawi, um, a professor named Mick Feezy from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine already had a large TIFI program. And this came out of work by Julian Gold, who is a mathematical modeler. And what they did is individuals would come into the clinic with TIFI. They would then follow up those individuals to their home, and they would try to see if they could identify TIFI in environmental samples. And so this kind of led to a larger program called DRUM, which is both in Malawi and Uganda, using environmental surveillance to largely try to understand bact bact key bacteria of interest. And in addition to the Taifi work, there's been a Wellcome Trust fellow who's really led trying to understand how we can use this kind of One Health model to identify ESLB L bacteria at many different levels. So the work that I'm doing is focusing on SARS-CoV-2 and virus, and really just specifically on water, wastewater, but we do have lots of different samples. So because this TIFI work was already occurring in 2020, we were able to quickly start sampling match samples for SARS-CoV-2. And again, we knew we could do this because of what groups had already shown in the US and Europe. With support from PATH, we were able to scale up to 80 sites in 2021. And so we're sampling 80 sites in just Blantyre district. Um, so this is a fairly kind of micro study in Malawi. We also are doing matched work on Salmonella and Typhi for all of these um, collection points. So kind of our decision tree, our methods, we sample at these sites, we take grab samples, large water samples, soil, rocks. <clears throat> we do a peg concentration for viral detection. And then we also culture samples, so rocks, um, uh, filter, more swab, et cetera, for bacterial detection. 
We do an RNA or DNA extraction, and then we can do single or multiplex diagnostics. For SARS-CoV-2, we are specifically using the CDC N1 assay because that's what we had available in Malawi when we started this. And it's also consistent to what we're doing with patient samples in the lab. We then can go on to do min-ion sequencing. Um, and I'll kind of get deeper into the sequencing in future slides. So this is a picture of a river. So kind of what we're dealing with in Malawi is this really informal sewage system where although we're sampling in rivers, we see a lot of fecal contamination <clears throat> and we can kind of map a population that might be you know, contributing to this fecal contamination. A few tech dev things we did. So early on the bacterial team was filtering water through a 0.45 micron filter to grab bacteria. And we were just taking the affluent. We tried, we wanted to compare that to just grab samples, which are just way easier. So these are just 50 ml grab samples. And we found that there wasn't really any difference. So we stopped doing the filtering step because it was quite labor intensive and quite expensive. The next thing we did was, oops, sorry, is we wanted to see if kind of the two widely like, like used concentration methods would work for us. So that's PEG, which is a glycolysis based concentration method and then milk flocculation. And we didn't really see big difference between those two concentration methods. And so we went with PEG because it was just a little bit more user-friendly and um, we were able to get the PEG in quickly. So going to our results, and I'm going to just flag some of the results around Typhi, but again, this is not my work. This is work being led by John Rigby. Um, we are able to detect Typhi in a variety of environmental samples. And I think if you're interested in doing this, please check out John's recent paper. He does a massive deep dive into the methods around detecting Typhi from a variety of different sample types. For the SARS-CoV-2 work, we started seeing positive samples as soon as we started looking. And I think this really mirrors what Renee and Claudia already discussed. Um, you definitely see it in sewage and wastewater um, very quickly on in the outbreak. So that was in May, 2020. In May, um, sorry, in July, 2020, we kind of saw our first peak in Malawi. This wasn't driven by a variant. This was just kind of driven by an increase as well as our respiratory season here. Um, and we saw a peak in our environmental samples as well. Our peak two was driven by beta. This kind of mirrors South Africa's data by about a month. And actually we generally mirror, mirror self, both at the population level and then kind of the environmental surveillance, we mirror South Africa by about a month. Um, we kind of missed this peak because it was right over our Christmas season, but we did see an uptick in January. And then more recently when Delta came into Malawi, we saw a huge increase in positivity in our environmental samples. So we wanted to sequence these samples to try to understand what variants were circulating and if we could use, if we could actually even sequence from wastewater. Um, so we've been using the Arctic protocol. So this is an amplicon sequencing based method. You are gonna tile that SARS-CoV-2 genome with about 90 primer sets, amplify that and then sequence that those amplified PCRs. So you're really just specifically sequencing SARS-CoV-2. Um, so we are doing this with Arctic three primers. They do have a newer version of primers that we would like, that we are going to try. We just don't have them in Malawi yet. We've been sequencing samples that range between CT of 32 and 38. And we get kind of varying results. So a lot of them, so on this y-axis is our percent coverage. And this is a really conservative percent coverage. So this is at 20x depth. And then on my x-axis is the original CT. And so you can see many of these, I'm getting really low coverage. I'm just getting you know really incomplete genomes. But I do have a few really good genomes and it does seem to kind of vary. And even some of my high CTs, I get good genomes. So either our CTs are a little inaccurate, right? We're kind of, we're, we're picking up SARS-CoV-2, but actually there's probably more circulating in that sample than we realize. Um, or, you know, we're able to do this because of this amplicon-based approach. Um, but I think if we had lower CTs, we would probably have better genomes. The other thing we wanted 
to do is just see if other methods would allow us to get more full genomes. And so Steve Patterson's group at the University of Liverpool recently developed a method called EasySeq, which is specific for wastewater, and it's what they're using in the UK. Um, it has a few really clever tricks, and it's definitely worth checking this out if you're already sequencing um, their protocol. And I, and I have all this information on subsequent slides, so don't worry about jotting this down. I have um, links to this. But they are able to get pretty good genome recovery from their sampling. So we were sequencing at about 20X with a min-ion. So min-ion, you're gonna get a lot more sequencing error. So you need to be a bit more conservative. With the Illumina sequencing, we're calling our genomes at 5X depth, which is a little less conservative, but we were able to get better genomes. So again, that's percent coverage on the Y axis. So what does this mean? What are we seeing? Um, so kind of throughout the outbreak, we ha have seen what we kind of expect. So we're seeing um, early on in the outbreak, um, sorry, early on in the outbreak, we are seeing kind of variants that are coming from Europe and Asia, just like everybody's seeing globally. And then in January and February and March, we're mainly picking up beta, which is what we're seeing in the patient population. And then in, Del in May, June, July, and August, we're picking up Delta. Um, the interesting thing for us is that on May 18th, we saw Delta in our water, and we didn't pick up a Delta in our hospitalized patient population until June 16th. In Blantyre and in Malawi, we are just slowly getting up to speed with sequencing in real time in our kind of community. So I think this next wave, we will have a better picture, but I still think this gives us, you know, potentially an early warning system by about a month when we expect to see a hospitalized patient. And this is kind of similar to the trends other groups are seeing where ES is a little predictive or is potentially predictive um, of what you're gonna see in the population. Um, the other thing we wanted to look at and the big question that we get asked a lot is how do you know what variant you're looking at? You have this sample with many, many individuals contributing to it, right? Especially in Malawi where we might have 100,000 to half a million people contributing to this area we're collecting. And so a group from Scripps has recently developed a pipeline to try to disentangle this. Um, so it's called Freeha. It's open source. It's already on GitHub. So if anybody wants to try it, I recommend it. What you're going to use is your BAM files. So those are your reads. Um, and it's going to be able to tell you what percentage your different variants are. So kind of two examples. This first one, this first line was about 66% beta and then 33% other. They can't always get to the exact other. Um, and then kind of these samples from May, June, and July are largely delta. And it's showing us delta with pretty high confidence. So this is a brand new, like a week old, it's still in beta. So if you do use it and you um, find it helpful or if there's things that you think could be improved, I'm happy to get you in contact with Josh Levy. Um, and you know, I think there's some room for improvement, but I think this is an exciting way we can start to disentangle these mixed samples. So the final thing we've been doing is trying to model, does ES data predict data at the kind of population of the district level? And so we're doing this um, with, in collaboration with the Gates Foundation. They actually have a modeling core group. And so Jillian Gold, who did some of the original Typhi work in Malawi, is leading this effort. And what she's finding is our ES data does predict DHO data about 21 days before a peak occurs, before the kind of top of the peak occurs. And this is with pretty high significance. So we saw this in the first peak back in 2020, and we've now been able to replicate it in the Delta peak. So we feel this is fairly, um, we're, we're, we're confident that we are seeing 
peaks in ES before we're seeing peaks in DHO data and that we can use this to predict. Now, what we need to decide or what we really need to disentangle is at what level of percent positivity do you say, okay, we think a surge is occurring and you start to you know, discuss this with your public health departments. And I think South Africa has already done a good job of working very tightly with their clinical and public health offices. And so we just need to kind of pick up on that here in Malawi. The other thing we are doing is we're going to try some of these variant RT-QPCR. So many of my samples have such a high CT, or even if they don't have a high CT, they just, I can't sequence them. I can't get a variant out of them um, or a good genome to call a variant. So we are going to try some of these RT-QPCRs. There's one from Promega. There's a few other companies that have developed one. And then Eric Alms Lab has a preprint that has um, some on it as well. We're going to do some more alumina sequencing. We also have matched bacteria data for all of these samples, as well as like fecal contamination and other environmental parameters. So we're just trying to get our heads around that. And then we also are going to multi do a multiplex to look for other viruses that are of interest in Malawi. So with that, um, I think there's some really key people to thank. Kat Anscombe has helped me with all the sequencing. John Rigby um, has really been instrumental in all these sites and has, has done all the typhi work. Oscar Kinjerwa is leading the SARS-CoV-2. Um, yeah, the SARS-CoV-2 diagnostics. And then we work really closely with our district health office. And then just to quickly just put a few slides and people can screenshot this or, or email me, but um, Arctic has really nice protocols. So if you are thinking of sequencing, I really recommend checking out their protocols. They're all online. These are all the reagents we're using here. This is the EasySeq protocol for Illumina. Um, if you try this and you have any problems, you can also email me and Steve Patterson said he's definitely happy to speak to people, but it's, it's again, an open source protocol and it's been, um, it's been really easy to use. I think the thing I flagged earlier that they do that I thought was really clever is at their, before they make cDNA, they concentrate their RNA. And so it's definitely worth doing that. We've had better results when we started doing that. And then for the analysis, <clears throat> we're using the Arctic pipelines for our, uh, to generate FASTA files. Again, we're being a little conservative because this FASTA file is going to be the major variant. So we're calling our FASTA, so we're calling our consensus genome at 90% identity or better. So it means we're going to be missing some of those minor variants when we call a consensus genome that are in our sample at 10% or less. But we still think that there's utility in understanding that, that main genome and seeing how that relates to your population. Um, there's some really good, call once you have a FASTA file, it's easy to call the variant either on GSA, next strain, pangolin. And then this is just the GitHub for the variant specific calling pipeline from Josh Levy at Scripps. So with that, um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Barnes. That was very interesting. We're now moving on to the, to the final speaker of today's workshop. And I would just like to personally uh, apologize to all the panelists if I have mispronounced your names. Um, but in this case, I'm pretty sure that I will. So I apologize very much. Um, I hope this is correct. Uh, Professor Wei Dean Manser, I hope that's correct. Um, she's our next speaker. Um, she's from the Department of Microbiology, Faculty of Medicine, uh, IABN Al Jazar, University of Seuss, uh, Tunisia. Her research interests span the general area of antimicrobial resistance with an emphasis on a One Health perspective analysis. In her working group, they work towards guidelines and methods protocols for surveillance of AMR in a One Health context. Such guidelines and protocols needs to be uh, uh, practic practicable comparable, simple, and cost-effective so they can be applied. Their objective is to find a way to perform global surveillance of AMR and to contribute with their experiences on their research of antimicrobial resistance profiles and detection of antimicrobial resistance genes in clinical and animal strains and environmental bacteria isolated from soil and water. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we look forward to your, to your talk. I'm Dr. Rujdan Mansour. I'm uh, an associate professor in microbiology in the Faculty of Medicine of uh, SUS. 
and uh, I'm, uh, I have the great pleasure to uh, be in this webinar for the African Perspective on AMR. Um, I uh, was in invited to talk about uh, the Tunisian context uh, in relation with this uh, ambiguous problem, which is the antimicrobial resistance. And I choose uh, to talk about the evolution of uh, this problem in Tunisia and the evolution of the uh, paradigm related to uh, this problem, the major challenges to overcome and the awareness of stakeholders in the Tunisian context. So um, uh, it's uh, clear that uh, it's an universal problem that the uh, WHO uh, talk about a great number of deaths by 2050, and it's alarming. And regarding this slide, uh, we are consensus that uh, the African continent is uh, really in a great problem, we'd say, in uh, 2050, with uh, a number of deaths related to AMR uh, reaching the uh, 10 per uh, 10,000 uh, inhabitants. So uh, it's clear that this problem is not also related just to humans and the one uh, health context uh, take birth from this uh, idea. So uh, we have uh, the human, we have the wildlife, we have the, the food, the, the animals, the environment, and we have also an, an intermediate vector which is the water, the environment, uh, which causes enormously uh, problem water, drinking water, uh, effluents, uh, all hydric uh, environment are in relation with this problem where the bacteria can, uh, can meet each other, when bacteria can uh, transmit inf information uh, via uh, plasmid or other uh, mobile genetic uh, elements. So uh, this is a great uh, problem what happened, what happened, it's, it's an universal problem. It's not uh, only reserved uh, to uh, Tunisia, but um, in Tunisia, the, the, the awareness, we have a great problem of awareness. Um, if we take a look at the uh, PubMed uh, uh, and we just type uh, uh, the keywords antimicrobial resistance in Tunisia, and we see here the evolution of the number of publications, uh, which is in accordance uh, with uh, what's happened in the world. So antimicrobial resistance is an evolutionary uh, problem. But the characteristic that we have here in Tunisia is that, uh, unfortunately, I would say, um, a great consumer of antibiotics. Uh, so we, we are classified as the second country, uh, not so far from Turkey, the first one, uh, consuming uh, antibiotics just uh, before Spain. And uh, uh, I think that uh, as a researcher, of course, that uh, this conception of uh, a huge amount of antibiotics is at the origin of the uh, epidemiological uh, states that we have here in Tunisia related to antimicrobial resistance. So um, we have a lot of, uh, of description, uh, essentially related to the resistance in gram-negative bacilli, uh, Enterobacteria, uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Asymptobacter bomeni, etc. And we have different profile of resistance. Uh, we have the description of cephalosporinases, the ESPL, extended spectrum beta-lactamase, also carbapenemases, resistance to cholestine. And this is a general problem, uh, a great problem. and. Um, as said by Einstein, uh, if we don't change our paradigm or our vision or our point of view, it's not uh, possible to resolve the problem. So we have to uh, use another thinking. So uh, as I said uh, at the first of my talk, um, I will talk about the evolution of this uh, paradigm. So our thinking, the old paradigm in the Tunisian context. Uh, so the we consider the antibiotic as a miraculous molecule, molecule normally. Um, we have a, a lack, a lack of stakeholder awareness, um, a lack or absence of effective monitoring system, um, the sensitization of the general population on the issue on, of uh, antimicrobial resistance is not so far a priority. And um, we didn't work in parallel in the same degrees of importance for the three contexts uh, considered by the one health context. So here I'm talking about the old paradigm. So uh, what uh, factors, uh, here I present the factors, sorry, 
the factors that um, led the emergence of uh, the antimicrobial resistance as a problem, an epidemiological problem here in Tunisia. So we take uh, the human context as a priority. We work on the guidelines for the antibioprophylaxis and antibiotherapy in the hospitals. But unfortunately, the other context, the animal and the environmental context, are not really um, taken in consideration. Uh, and uh, this made that there are just punctual investigation in the uh, hospital context with clinical isolates. So we characterize mechanism of resistance um, by the uh, ARG, ARB, the plasmid, the clones, etc. And we talk about the human context, uh, context without particular links to the other context. So here is the, um, the old paradigm. So the new paradigm uh, enhanced in Tunisia, I would say, um, in the beginning of the 2005, 2006, and we uh, begin to talk about um, resistance in the veterinary context. We begin to take care about the environmental uh, context. And um, this was, uh, was con concretized by the uh, elaboration and the signature of the NAEP, uh, the National Action Plan in Tunisia, that was in November 2019. And uh, the contributors were the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of uh, Agriculture. So, uh, after uh, the uh, 2005 and 6, as I said, there's uh, um, a larger amount, we'll say, a larger amount of awareness of the importance of the other context. Uh, we begin to work together to plan strategies, etc., in the one health context, taking in consideration all the contexts. And we begin to think about uh, getting funding for the uh, epidemiological monitoring, but also to implement all strategic and operational plans uh, predicted in the National Action Plan. So there's a lot of meeting uh, between the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture, also with the FAO and the WHO. And um, the strategic plan, operational plan are ready, and you are looking for funding to uh, really uh, enhance this procedure. So uh, in my part of uh, work, of my responsibility as a researcher, um, and with my team, uh, we uh, worked on the three contexts. I will uh, give you a feedback from uh, our experience, our results in the um, uh, study of the antibiotic resistance, antimicrobial resistance, essentially to cephalosporin, carbapenem, and colistine in the three contexts, in the human context, veterinary context, and the environmental context. So for, for the human context, here is the map of Tunisia. Uh, we are located in Sousse, just in the Mediterranean Sea. And we have worked on three uh, major university hospitals in this uh, location, in the uh, center east of uh, Tunisia. And we have described a lot of uh, gram-negative bacilli resistance, resistant with uh, produ producing uh, carbapenemases, producing ESPN. We have characterized the plasmid of resistance, etc. And we have made molecular studies related to the type, uh, sequence type, etc., the clonality of strains. So uh, there was punctual studies related to human context. We have done also uh, studies related to animal context, and we have integrated Kerouan and Bizert, which is located in the north of Tunisia. And in the animal context, we have uh, taken in consideration um, domestic animals, uh, food producing animals, uh, also um, fish and uh, seafood. And we have described uh, also ESPL uh, and sometimes carbapenemases, resistance to colistine, etc. From this type of results, we have the idea to compare the um, strains isolated from the human context and the animal context, and we have uh, determined a lot of clonality between the strains. So there is a molecular evidence that um, uh, bacteria resist to antibiotic is circulating between the different contexts. So here there is results from also from fish when we have described the, um, the INCAF plasmid uh, harboring the CTXM cans. So for the environmental context, 
we have the idea to retrace um, the um, passage of the, the water from the hospital to uh, the Mediterranean Sea. So as you see here, we have the um, great university hospital, a very uh, big university hospital in the region of Sousse, which named it Sahloun. And here in this uh, star, red star, we have the um, weight, uh, wastewater treatment plant. And here we have the Mediterranean Sea. So here we have a community. The effluents from the hospital are communicated from urban uh, circuit via the, and uh, with this community uh, effluent water. Uh, they enter the uh, WWTP and then after treatment they are re related in the Mediterranean Sea. And the idea was to compare clinical isolates isolated in the hospital with effluents from the hospital and um, the inflow and outflow of water um, entering the WWTP. So uh, we have a molecular evidence that for Escher Shakudi, for example, uh, the same clinical isolate is retrieved in the hospital effluents, also in the inflow and the outflow sewage. We have done also uh, this work for Clepsia lab pneumonia, and we have retrieved the same result. So we have the evidence. We have the evidence that um, uh, antimicrobial resistant bacteria and multi drug resistant bacteria are circulating between the different compartments. Um, not only human food producing, as I said, also domestic animals, seafood, etc. And uh, the, um, uh, the problem is more larger than uh, we think. So the change of the paradigm, as I said uh, uh, in the first of my talk, is the necessity to really uh, enhance the, uh, to combat this uh, problem of antimicrobial resistance. So what we have is just the uh, part that appears from the iceberg. And we are consensus that uh, the problem is more uh, deep than, uh, than it appears. And for that, um, we have reached for uh, several collaborations to get funding to, uh, to do research on this uh, sanitary problem, this health problem. So um, funding begin with a French-Tunisian collateral project um, named uh, Antimicrobial Resistance One Health Project and which is um, fin financed by the Campus France uh, with uh, the team of uh, ANSES in Lyon, France, uh, Marie Zaini and uh, Jean-Yves Madec. And then uh, we have initiated uh, several networking uh, with my team. Uh, we are in the network, we were in the network waves, which finished in June 2020, Wildlife, Agriculture, Soils, Water, Environment and Antimicrobial Resistance. It was a network of 27 partners from, uh, from 16 countries. Then we, uh, we are also a part of a network of a cast action, uh, named European Network for Optimization of Veterinary Antimicrobial Treatment, you know that. And um, after that, we join uh, a team researcher um, in the research project of Pairwise, uh, which I suppose that uh, Carl Pedersen have talked about, dispersal of antibiotic resistance and antibiotics in water ecosystem and influence on livestock and aquatic wildlife. And where we have 10 study areas in five countries and where we are sampling not only uh, reaching the, uh, the antibacterial uh, resistant, the antimicrobial resistant bacteria, but also the presence of um, antibiotic molecules, which will be considered as um, an element that will cause um, pressure on antibiotic to uh, provide mechanism of resistance. And we have to analyze antibiotic, antibiotic resistant bacteria and antibiotic resistant genes. And this project take place in September 2021 uh, until um, uh, August 2024. Also, uh, we have another research project named Envire, which uh, just has been accepted in November 2021 and which begin in April 2022. And uh, it's in relation, just uh, pairwise was the uh, project where we have to describe uh, the epidemiological situation of resistance, especially in wild uh, birds and in water. Here, uh, this uh, IRANET GPA-MR action uh, is a kind of solution 
uh, to intervene to uh, intervention, sorry, to control the dynamics of antimicrobial resistant farm chicken through the environment. And um, it will begin in April 2022 uh, until March 2025. And Tunisia will uh, receive the funds from the International Center for Antimicrobial Resistance Solutions in Denmark. So, um, in the different uh, network or in the different research project, the advantage is uh, that as a research team, we involved a great number of stakeholders. We have a number of uh, letters of intent. Um, and here there is a consistency that uh, the antimicrobial resistance bacteria is really a threat uh, to treat in Tunisia. So uh, awareness of stakeholders take place in Ministry of Health, in Ministry of Agriculture, Water Resources and Fisheries, and especially in the Center for Agriculture Development, in the directions of uh, veterinary services, and in the National Sanitation Office, which is concerned by the uh, wastewater treatment plant. So um, I will finish by uh, thank, uh, thank you for this invitation, first of all, and then to thank uh, all my uh, colleagues, uh, all my students, and uh, all my collaborators in uh, in Europe and uh, otherwise. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I will go to the questions that were asked in the um, question section because I see someone, uh, lots of people gave some uh, very good insights. Um, and now, of course, that I need to find them, they have disappeared from my screen. Uh, there we go. The first question that was given uh, that we can discuss in this panel is that um, COVID is relatively frequently measured. Uh, in terms of antimicrobial resistance, how, would, how frequently would be necessary to, to um, survey that in the environment or from wastewater? If someone wants to chime in to that one with their perspectives. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, Rene, <laughs> maybe you have some insight into this? Sure, so uh, the short answer is depending on the objective um, of your research and the surveillance program that you're rolling out. So what you're looking at, what you're looking for, of course, you know, what you need to get from the sample is the most bang for your buck. So sampling is expensive to collect these samples. Um, we would love to do daily sampling. Uh, our program at the moment, um, you know, uh, we're doing weekly, which is giving us a lot of information. But again, uh, you know, twice or thrice or everyday sampling would give us, uh, you know, a different um, information. So I think it's about how you set up your program, what you want to um, what you want to determine and you've also got to think about you know the people involved uh, the funding involved and what your main aim is i suppose also the fact that um, amr um, has a bit of a longer duration in terms of, of risk than something like uh, COVID does so would something like monthly surveillance would be more practical than weekly in terms of of, of uh, trying to um, account for the costs that it might have. Yeah, again, I think it, it depends on the aim uh, of the surveillance and I'll gladly hand over to my other panelists. Um, but, you know, the more, the more data points you have, the more, you know, the better. Um, but again, it's a, it's a cost, um, yeah, a cost a factor as well. Yes, of course. So um, I am very much a viral person, so um, I'm just going to caveat that. But I think one of the big kind of take homes we've seen from both the Typhi work and the SARS-CoV-2 work is that you get hot spots where you can you consistently see different pathogens, bacterial and viral, in that same collection site. So I think if you're thinking about scaling an ES program for an AMR, Typhi, you know, SARS doing a slightly larger catchment first and then honing into like the important sites is a good approach. Um, 
the other thing we're going to try this year is collecting at our main hospital really like consistently daily to pick up AMR. And we think that's where you're going to maybe start to see it first before it kind of enters the community, potentially, potentially not. We have a, a we don't have the same situation as they do in Tunisia where there is tons of antibiotic use, but there's still a lot here and it's not that easy to control where people are using it. And I think that also creates a little bit of a headache of where you sample and how often. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. That was a, was a good reply. Um, the next question is a bit, I think it touches on all the panelists actually, but it's about increasing, uh, including other organisms uh, other than bacteria and viruses, for example, what about um, the emergence of anti um, um, multidrug resistance in fungi in water? Um, uh, uh, Dr. Barnes, I, I believe that your um, nanopore sequencing technologies for identifying the variants, could this be applied to something like fungi? Yeah, so my background is actually in kind of more metagenomic sequencing from a patient sample. And so when we do that, we see everything, right? You see the bacteria, you see, and, and this was kind of work that, came, that was during the Ebola outbreak, a more recent loss of fever outbreak in West Africa, and then during Zika outbreak in Brazil. And so we are trying to apply some of those to wastewater. It is so much more difficult with wastewater. And it's also so much more expensive to sequence and get any kind of interesting metagenomic information. And I think that's probably more of an Illumina-based approach. But um, there are, I mean, there are now, like there's no reason you couldn't do Amplicon kind of panels to a variety of different pathogens and then sequence those using a minion. And so I think little by little more kind of Amplicon based PCR, you know, pools will become available so people can look at their bespoke pathogens. But yeah, there's a lot of, I think this is like wide open, this, this yeah, area. Absolutely. Um, uh, Dr. Stange, maybe you can, uh, can provide some insight into this. Um, yes, of course, you can also look for fungi and antibiotic resistant genes, but um, yeah, I think that's the problem with the antibiotic resistance. There's a broad spectrum of different bacteria, fungi, genes, so you have to focus on something because you, if you lost the focus, then um, it's difficult. So yes, I think absolutely. that's a an important point, what parameters should be monitored? That's uh, one question I think that has to be answered in the next years. Because we, not can, we cannot look for all of the different parameters. Yeah. So, that's... So, so that actually flows into the next question. I think it's a very important question and it ties together the whole surveillance aspect, um, which I will read directly from, from the person who asked it. The monitoring of wastewater is very beneficial and should be implemented for more such like research, including antibiotic genes, um, antibiotic resistance genes. I am just wondering, uh, is this research approach viable worldwide in terms of the need of expensive equipment, training and funding? And if not, how can countries support one another? Is it the responsibility of the WHO and UN to help bridge this gap or a transdisciplinary solution required between governments, wastewater treatment plants, investors, pharmaceutical companies and the public? Very, very deep question, I think. Uh, how is this feasible to implement these surveillance techniques or technologies or strategies throughout the world? Um, I, I can chime in about the sequencing. So sequencing is definitely getting easier and cheaper. I mean, I think that's what Nanopore has done really, really well. So, you know, you're gonna maybe lose some of that ability to look at tons of pathogens in one sample. But I mean, we are sequencing on their minion, on their tiniest device. And I think the costs are, are really coming down and you can do it with you know, fairly rudimentary infrastructure. And, and now in most countries, even Malawi, one of the poorest countries, we have a few labs that can do that. Um, I think it will always have to be in kind of low and middle income countries centralized to a few key research or governmental um, or hospital settings. Um, I think to the other half of that question, I'm going to let the other panels take that because I don't have as much experience. Does anyone else wish to chime in on this? Yeah, that's more or less what I said before. I think we need some key parameters that can be monitored all over the world. So there must be a, yeah, a selection. <laughs> a selection. 
Yes. Yeah. How about countries like, for example, Professor Victor said um, something about only there only being four wastewater treatment plants in the whole of Nigeria, as I understood correctly. How do we monitor that? Do we? I mean, the, the good thing about a wastewater treatment plant is it's a nice centralized collection point to get samples. But sampling from a river, there are external factors that maybe might influence the results. How, how does how do we get to sample these types of places? I'll uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. you go, Rena, yeah. you go first. Yeah, Dr. Sure. Street, I think, yeah. <laughs> So there's some great work being done by uh, many teams using passive samplers to collect, um, um, you know, uh, water, uh, different um, samples from different water bodies. And they are showing, at least definitely with SARS-CoV-2 and, and other uh, pathogens, you can see trends. Um, you know, even if it's, um, you know, you can see the difference between a wave and a, and a non-wave in a, in a, um, during COVID time. So. I think this just needs to be explored a little bit more, but there's so much exciting research to be done around this about how we can then uh, explore this type of um, environmental surveillance in different water bodies. Okay, passive yeah. surveillance. Okay. Yeah, so just to piggyback on that, in, in Blantyre, we're largely sampling these really informal sewage systems. So we're not actually sampling any formal sewage system. Uh, so we have a lot of informal sewage systems and then mainly just rivers that are kind of acting as a uh, catchment. Mm -hmm. um, but we can link that to the population and actually there's fairly good population, worldwide population data now that you can use. And you can, using things like ArcGIS and other tools, you can look at the flow of your rivers or the flow of your kind of body of water and you can actually map the population you're catching. And so, you know, I, I think some of those, um, tools that have already been developed. But again, it kind of goes back to my previous point. Sometimes you have to sample a lot of sites and then you can kind of hone in on the key sites. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, Malawi has almost no sewage systems either. So it's something we, I think we probably are having a lot of false negatives, but maybe not very many false, but probably zero false positives. Perfect. All right, well, thank you so much to our panelists for this session and the previous session. Um, it was so nice to hear everyone's perspectives.